Good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Esquivel, Chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Today is Tuesday, February 1st. It is 9 a.m., and I would like to call this meeting to order. I'll begin by introducing my fellow board colleagues. Joining me today is Vice Chair Doreen Diadamo, Board Member Nicole Morgan, and Board Member Sean McGuire. Joining us today as well is our Executive Director, Eileen Sobeck, our Chief Counsel, Michael Lawfer, our two Chief Deputies, Eric Oppenheimer and Jonathan Bishop, and our Clerk of the Board is Janine Townsend, and assisting her today is Margie Argel and Courtney Tyler. As you can see, this meeting is being webcast and recorded. Uh, if you intend to speak on any of the items on our agenda today, you should be here on the Zoom platform with us, or otherwise you're viewing us through our uh, web stream on Kelly PA or YouTube Live. Uh, if you are not here on the platform and you do intend on commenting on one of our items, uh, you need to follow the instructions that are at the top of uh, and the link at the top of today's agenda. Um, if you are having any difficulty uh, filling out the form and getting a blue speaker card, Ms. Townsend can uh, assist you and you can email her directly at commentletters at waterboards.ca.gov and we'll make sure uh, you get here on the platform. Once you're here, your cameras are turned off, you will be muted. Uh, until it is your uh, turn to speak on the item you've indicated you wish to speak on. Uh, with that all the way, uh, we can move on to our agenda. Uh, before we get to public forum, today we have a presentation of the Superior Accomplishment Awards, and would like to call up uh, Julie Rosardo to uh, present them. Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, my name is Julie Rosardo. I'm one of the Assistant Deputy Directors in the Division of Water Rights. And today it is my pleasure to present these Sustained Superior Accomplishment Awards to members of the Russian River Emergency Drought Regulation Team. Board members and others may be familiar with the work that the team did, but those that are listening to the webcast or may not be familiar, the Russian River faced its hottest and driest record last year with the lowest precipitation in the upper watershed in over 127 years of record. As a result, levels in Lake Mendocino were lower than at any point in the last 45 years. And without the amazing work of this team and committed local stakeholders and partners, the upper, shed water, the upper watershed faced a real crisis and a threat of running dry. That included drinking water supplies to tens of thousands of people and thousands of acres of irrigated agriculture, supporting the livelihoods and economies of thousands more. And I know that may sound dramatic, but it only highlights the pressure and environment that this team was thrust into. And they responded with grace, efficiency, poise, and an attitude of collaboration that continues today to receive accolades from the very communities that we regulate from the affected stakeholders. This team was able to draft and adopt with the board's support, the first formal emergency drought curtailment regulations that implemented the board's priority system. At the same time, staff developed a new methodology for applying the state's priority system, a technical methodology that was developed during the last drought, but now was ready to implement at the watershed scale. The rollout of that methodology and curtailment required thousands of cumulative staff hours in an entire team to review data, coordinate with partners, run precipitation and climate models, and integrate those two disparate data sets into something that was actually usable and understandable to the general public. That methodology can now serve as a template throughout our state. Staff have been, of course, working very long hours, collaborating with partners, but efforts began in earnest in the summer of 2020. Staff work with diverters, local agencies and elected officials to hold dozens of stakeholder meetings. The engagement that this team um, offered was just unprecedented. Um, they explained concerns. Um, they talked about the conditions, the hydrologic conditions as they developed and changed rapidly. And this work continues today. Even as those wet conditions were so promising in December have shifted to a record dry January, and we're looking at continued dry conditions into the future. But with that, this team did an amazing job and it's my sincere pleasure to present these awards. And as a note, Eric sends his regards and he wanted to pass along his sincere thanks for the team. Unfortunately, he's been pulled away 
to a separate meeting and couldn't be here in person today, but he wanted to make sure that that in no way reflects anything less than complete and total admiration and gratitude for the work done by this team. Thank you and job well done. And with that, I'd like to read out the names. And as I call your name, please turn your camera on if you're able and leave it on until I'm done reading the rest of the list so that we can uh, properly honor you virtually. So with that, uh, the Russian River team, first we have Sam Bolin Bryan, Philip Dutton, Sam Cole, Andrew Deringer, Jonathan Pham, Alyssa Annenberg, Michael Rubens, Sam Warner, Jacob Walker, Jane Ling, Darren Pedroja, Jaspreet Gill, Jeff Parks, Wilhelmina Chon, Isara Tananat, Keenan Smith, Shay Richardson, Carl Beckham, Dan Schultz, Kenneth Petrozelli, and John Isburner. Thank you, and let's all give this team a wonderful virtual round of applause. Just, you know, thank you incredibly. Uh, as we uh, remarked when it came to uh, the Bay Delta team, uh, we're in an incredible situation here uh, where we're actually uh, implementing the water rights system for the first time in the state, which may come as a surprise for some, but it, this is an incredible and monumentous moment. And the, the fact that uh, you know, the, the work was really begun uh, two years ago in the water, uh, Russian River watershed, uh, looking, looking out ahead, understanding that there were going to be challenges, but really working with the community first and foremost, um, really shined a light, if you will, and, and helped lead the way with other watersheds as well, since the Russian was, was our first year in acting this last year. And so I can't thank you enough. Um, I know that there were many long hours. I know these were uh, really incredibly fraught times. Um, an incredible amount of stress, certainly, given the, the stakes and the circumstances that communities were facing uh, this last summer. And here, as we uh, kind of anticipate what um, may be a worst case scenario, if we don't see additional uh, rain materialize this year, uh, are prepared to, to continue to act, to continue to iterate off of this incredible effort that you all have, have been at the, the forefront here. Uh, so I can't just uh, thank you enough. And I think, uh, Julie, you know, Thank you for, for stepping in here and, and, uh, and continuing to, to lead uh, as well. And uh, you said the, the word correctly, um, grace. Uh, what, what we really saw was an incredible amount of grace from this team, um, given the pressure and given the, the high stake circumstances, but just the, the way that you were all so very communicative with the communities uh, and really bridging both the complex methodology and, and work that we were doing to try to, to, to best have a grasp on you know, again, administering water rights in a way that really protects communities here uh, while still um, bringing folks along uh, and creating the trust that's that's really fundamental to the work that we do here at the board. So I, I can't thank you enough. Um, you, you're all in, incredible here and, and just want to um, just thank you uh, incredibly from, from the bottom of my heart here and kick it over to any uh, board colleagues that uh, want to share any thoughts as well. I would and, and just uh, say ditto to everything that the chair said and just add to that that um, because I'm liaison to that region and have also just a special interest in administration of our water rights system, I continue to follow this closely and I just want to pass on to you that in every communication I've had with stakeholders, I always hear the, how much they really appreciate staff. Um, they may not agree 100% um, uh, with the outcome of our decision, but they really appreciate the time that you all have taken to be thoughtful and continue to hear their concerns and to engage with them, um, hopefully toward um, some sort of a voluntary agreement um, going forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Chair. Yeah, and I'll just say, uh, looking here on 
at the uh, gallery view, I see a lot of familiar faces. And it's good to see you all, especially those I haven't seen for a while, a couple of years now. Um, and I'm reminded, having once worked in water rights, that you know this was something that you were probably not anticipating, that you probably had already had a full slate of other tasks and projects you were working on and had to pull, pick this up um, when the, the emergency was recognized and we were facing the drought. And, and you did. You took the charge knowing that you already had a full workload uh, and and that is not unrecognized from on my part. And I really appreciate all the time and dedication and your ability just to be fluid and adapt to changing circumstances and knowing that you know whatever may come, we just need to be ready for that. And you showed that here um, with what you were able to accomplish in a very short amount of time. So thank you. Thank you, board member. Comments that have already been made and say thank you all. Thank you, thank you, board member. Uh, so I just can't uh, thank you enough, truly all, and look forward to what I know will be a lot of further discussion, a lot more work uh, here in the year ahead, but um, let's take a moment here uh, to acknowledge, uh, celebrate, and just truly thank you all for the dedication that that you've shown this, this last uh, summer under, again, incredible um, stress and, and circumstances, um, but I couldn't, couldn't think of a, a greater outcome, and so thank you. Thank you again, Julie. And uh, look forward to, to continuing to make sure we uh, take the time here to acknowledge um, our incredible teams uh, at the State Water Board. Um, there's a, a, certainly a, a lot going on between our, our number of divisions, financial assistance, uh, water quality, drinking water, but here Water Rights um, has had a, a quite the incredible year. So thank you all again. Okay, with that, uh, we can move on to now our um, public forum where any member of the public wishing to address the board on an uh, item not calendared before the board can do so. And we have first up uh, Ernesto Palares from uh, Intercom Energy. And I believe he's being joined by Mario uh, Dominguez Marcos. Hello. Good morning. Hi. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shin. Uh, my name is Ernesto Pallares, President of and CEO of Intercom Energy Inc. Uh, my base is in San Diego, California, for 20 years. In the California energy crisis, Intercom won uh, to supply power to the California state government organized for the DWR, offering one of the low price of this transaction. The state of California directly for DWR saved about to the $290 million for the electric power sold by Intercom Energy. Now, we want to help with the emergency of the drugs. For a special purpose in the global warming, Intercom has integrated to the Climate Engineer Division with expertise, scientists, and climate atmosphere with experience for more of two decades. Development, <clears throat> I'm sorry, to the serious advance of the climate solution, drugs mitigation, ray induction, dam replacement, and will fire prevention if, with success result. Uh, for more graphic, we prepare for four minutes, one video. Thank you, sir. Gregory. The biggest challenge humanity has ever faced is scientifically known to be planetary warming. Climate change is personally affecting us all. It is at the doorstep, no longer some distant reality that happens to them and not us. The United Nations points out that 40% of the world's population will experience water scarcity in our lifetime.
the degradation of ecosystems worldwide has a negative impact on global productivity and social economic stability. Climate change is happening now, and it's classified as a global security issue. Agricultural expansion, cattle breeding, timber extraction, mining, oil exploitation and infrastructure development, to name a few, are all partly to blame when observing a significant loss in biodiversity and forest mass. These actions have in turn negatively affected meteorological processes and exasperated the losses, giving rise to extreme weather scenarios, droughts, forest and wildfires at alarming rates worldwide. As overwhelming as these challenges may seem, a strategic alliance between Intercom Energy and Climate Advanced Solutions offers large-scale answers to atmospheric issues including wildfires and droughts. Intercom Energy, on the one hand, are experts in the distribution of energy between the United States and Mexico, and during the past energy crisis have achieved massive savings of over $290 million for the state of California alone. On the other hand, Climate Advanced Solutions, the Climate Engineering Division of Intercom Energy, have significantly mitigated the effects of negative meteorological processes throughout the globe by applying their patented technology and expertise to the problem of global warming. Our Climate Engineering Division, CED, is made up of scientists and experts with over two decades of experience focusing on the development and implementation of projects at a worldwide level. Over the past two decades, they have applied their knowledge and infrastructure to enterprises throughout Asia, Israel, and Mexico, and their successful results are endorsed by the International Scientific Committee. The principal services that Intercom Energy and CED offer are in technology dealing with induction of rain, the replenishment of dams, and the atmospheric prevention of wildfires and droughts. We work using the Applied Theory of Atmospheric Electrical Fields, which has been published by the UNESCO and is supported by patents. As represented in the video you're watching here, this technology can positively correct the atmosphere of large territorial regions, increasing precipitation and improving natural meteorological processes. Official data confirms that our technology and know-how increase moisture proliferation over large territorial areas in nine Mexican states, demonstrating a significant 65% decrease in wildfires and forest fires. The technology is state-of-the-art and uses the available energy of the atmosphere in a condensation process. Designed to be safe by using direct current, there is zero disruption to any electrical fields within its perimeter. With our sustainable solutions and environmentally friendly track record, Intercom Energy and its Climate Engineering Division are ready to roll out proven technologies that are guaranteed to have a significant impact on the atmospheric prevention of wildfires and droughts in the state of California. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Pilars. I appreciate you taking the time to introduce us to your company this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think we can go to our next uh, speaker, who I believe is uh, Spencer Fern. And um, it looks like, and um, Mr. Fern, I'll just note that it looks like um, your comments uh, may be related to harmful algal blooms and may be um, also best as part of our discussion around the temporary urgency change petition, but um, I'll let you uh, have your comments here, but we'll just flag for staff that we'll treat them as part of comments as part of that discussion as well. So good morning, Mr. Fern. Morning, good morning. Uh, did, yeah, and just somewhere only have a comment on, um, just a comment letter. But um, good morning, Chair Escaval and the board members. I'm Spencer Fern with Restore the Delta. And uh, at last month's board, me board meeting, DWR did make a report regarding HABs in the Delta, um, commenting almost entirely on the Franks track. Um, I sent a comment letter to board staff this last, last week addressing our concerns on their verbal and published report. And uh, this morning, I just wanted to bring some attention to it. I believe that DWR omitted a few important points, including the impacts of HABs on densely populated urban communities, 
and high traffic recreation areas in the Delta. And we just want to remind the board that harmful algal blooms are the manifestations of warm water temperatures, nutrient runoff, lack of flow, sunlight, and circulation problems. A successful mitigation strategy will tackle all of these factors. Thank you for the time to comment. Thank you, Mr. Friend. I appreciate you uh, bringing to attention uh, your points and your comments this morning to the board. Thank you. Okay, with that, we are uh, done, uh, concluded with public comment um, and public forum and appreciate everyone's um, patience and time is uh, really appreciate that we uh, provide this time to allow folks to address the board. Uh, we can now move on to uh, our agenda and uh, consider board meeting minute uh, adoption for the January 4th, 5th board meeting and the January 19th, 20th board meeting. Are there any uh, any adjustments or or anything to flag on the minutes? And then otherwise, would I entertain a motion? So I do believe, Chair Eskola, that we'll need to take these up separate. Okay. The votes for each one. Okay, then we'll go ahead and um, instead of a combined uh, item one, uh, we'll have first vote be on uh, the January fourth, fifth uh, board meeting minutes. I'll move to adopt the January 4th by board meeting minutes. I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Townsend. Can you please call the roll call vote? Certainly. Board member Morgan. Aye. Board member McGuire. Aye. Vice Chair Diadama. Aye. Chair Esquivel. Aye. Um, the only thing about oh. that. I abstain. Apologies. There you go. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you, you all. Great. Thank you. And uh, the, the vote carries and the board meeting minutes are adopted. Uh, next would be the board meeting minutes for the January 19th and 20th board meeting. Any adjustments and otherwise uh, motion? I'll move adoption of the January 19th and 20th board meeting. I'll second. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Townsend, can you please call the roll call vote? Yes. Vice Chair Diadama. Aye. Board Member Morgan. Aye. Board Member McGuire. Aye. And Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you as well. Uh, vote carries and uh, the board meeting minutes from the January 19th and 20th board meeting is adopted. With that, we can move on to our informational items. Uh, first up, we have a drought and uh, current hydrologic conditions update. Uh, just a note uh, for folks, you know, uh, we're gonna stand, we've standardized at this point that each board meeting will have a drought update and current hydrologic update. Uh, we know that here at the start of the month is when DWR's bulletins come in. So it's really that second meeting uh, of the month that will have a more thorough, um, if you will, understanding of where we are uh, hydrologically. And then here at the first board meeting of every month, we will also have our urban water conservation update. So just for what, you know, help in planning for everyone. And so with that, item number two, good to see you, Mr. Laird. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll be, uh, my name is Jeff Laird. I'm a water resources control engineer in the division of water rights Bay Delta Sacramento unit, and I'll be giving a quick update on precipitation summaries for the water year, uh, current status of reservoirs, uh, drought status, near-term meteorological forecasts, and uh, lastly, a quick update on Delta curtailments and compliance. Uh, next slide, please. One more, <laughs> thanks. Um, we'll start off with an update on our precipitation indices. Um, no major precipitation events, unfortunately, had hit the Sierra in the last month. Um, while December was well above average, the dry January has brought our total precipitation for the water year down to what is about average for this time of year. Um, in the Northern Sierra Index, we have about 31.5 inches of precipitation, which is slightly above average at 119%. Next slide, please. In the San Joaquin, um, there's been about uh, just a little over 
20 inches, which is just above average at 106%. Next slide. And in the Tulare Basin, we have 13 inches of precipitation, which is just below average at 97% for this time of year. Next slide, please. Similarly, um, our overall snow water content in each basin sits around 55% to 60% of the April 1st average, which is about right at average uh, for today's date, historically. Next slide, please. I'm just going to provide a brief update on reservoir conditions around the state since not, um, since much of these haven't changed significantly. Um, overall conditions are, like I said, the same as the beginning of the year. Um, most reservoirs have storages that are below historical averages um, with a few exceptions. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the drought monitor for California as of late last week, almost all of California is out of the worst tiers of drought that we saw last year, um, which would be in the darker red colors, but remains in the moderate to severe range. Next slide, please. And across the US, uh, drought conditions are predicted to remain in place in most of the Western US, um, which is a little less optimistic than we saw last month when drought conditions were predicted to improve uh, based on these forecasts. Next slide, please. Uh, next, we'll quickly look at the temperature and precipitation outlooks for the next month. Um, in terms of temperatures, we're expected to have a more or less normal February in California. Next slide. And looking at precipitation, this forecast also predicts a relatively average month ahead. Next slide. Um, so looking at our ongoing curtailments in the Delta, uh, we have reimposed curtailments in a few watersheds due to recent dry conditions following our blockbuster December. And as conditions remain dry into this month, uh, we anticipate needing to expand those curtailments. Um, and just as a reminder, we are continuing to release updates weekly until there's a precipitation event on the horizon. And you can find, you can find those and more uh, at the Delta Drought web page, the link shown here. Um, also showing a, an overview of our compliance metrics here. And if you'd like to take a closer look, you can visit the link at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, for me is, uh, or Term 91 curtailments. Uh, they are currently not in effect due to sustained negative supplemental project water and delta outflows. Um, we expect that supplemental project water will trend positive until we get another precipitation event, um, but we'll keep everyone posted as we usually do. Um, and with that, uh, thank you everyone for your time. I'm going to hand this presentation over to Stephen Louie for updates from Mill and Deer Creek. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Uh, good morning. I'm Stephen Louie with the Division of Water Rights, uh, Bay Delta section, and I'll go over the curtailments for Mill and Deer Creeks. Um, the 50 cubic feet per second requirement has been met consistently since the regulations were adopted uh, or implemented in early October. Uh, staff will continue to monitor conditions as the irrigation season begins this spring. Um, so far, the um, Flow has been met because we had a pretty wet uh, winter so far, and typically the diversions are low in the late fall and winter. Um, the resolution for the emergency regulation did require that staff follow up on a couple of topics. Uh, first was the staff were to coordinate with the Department of Water Resources and other entities on the needs for stream gauge calibrations or modifications to support the drought emergency flows or long-term needs. And second, staff were to coordinate with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the National Marine Fishery Service, and stakeholders on the creeks to discuss long-term solutions uh, needed for the Deer Creek fisheries, such as in-stream flow needs, water use efficiency, water conservation measures, habitat uh, improvements, and potential funding. Uh, next, I'll go over these uh, the activities that we've completed on the two topics. Next slide. 
Um, in early November, uh, after the flow gauge on Mill Creek fell below the 50 cubic feet per second, we were notified by the Los Molinos Mutual Water Company uh, of apparent errors on the flow readings because they were showing a large difference between the upstream and downstream gauges, even though they had low diversions. Uh, BWR was able to confirm the errors in the gauges, uh, the gauge readings, and recalibrated the gauge. But the actual flows were closer to 100 CFS. Um, in January, DWR informed the State Water Board that they were in the process for uh, planning to install a new gauge on the Mill Creek to address the challenges they currently have at that gauge. Uh, they plan on mo moving that gauge upstream uh, a bit to avoid the Beaver Dam and the channel geometry, which makes frequent uh, calibrations necessary. They plan on installing a new gauge this year, and hopefully this new gauge can address the issues that were brought up during the uh, adoption process. Next, next slide. Um, next, local cooperative solutions activities that we've had so far. Uh, in, in October, the Department of Fish and Wildlife met with Los Molinos Mutual Water Company, Tip Creek Irrigation District, and Sanford Vineyard Irrigation Company to discuss draft voluntary drought initiative agreements. Uh, the main concerns that were brought up by the water users were a lack of compensation for their in-stream flows and pumping credits from the Delta. Uh, Delta uh, fish agreements. Uh, the, the Delta fish agreement credits were available during the 2015 drought, but unfortunately it looks like they won't be available this year. The parties still haven't agreed on the conditions for the agreements, but uh, those talks are still pending. Uh, in December of 21, our last year, a state water board staff extended invitations to the fishery agencies, water users, and other stakeholders in Mill Creeks, uh, Mill and Deer Creeks to discuss solutions to comprehensively protect water supply and sets of the species. Uh, we had difficulties in um, scheduling the meetings, but we plan on, we're in the process of scheduling the meetings for later this month. Uh, state board staff will update the uh, board members at a later time. Uh, next, Sample and Bryant will go over the Russian River contaminants. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Sam and Bryan with the Division of Water Rights. And so in the Russian River, staff continue to evaluate uh, supply and demand as described in the regulation. And those analyses have resulted in a temporary suspension of curtailments since late October uh, when we had the big storms. On January 24th, we extended that temporary suspension through March 1st, 2022. So our analysis is showing that um, current supplies are, are able to meet water rights demands within the system. Our, our compliance status is, and this is based on uh, responses to the curtailments, is up around 92%, has been fairly stable there. And the, the information on those responses is available through our interactive response tracker. If we go to the next slide. So this is a graph of uh, storage at Lake Mendocino. And while I note that currently supplies are sufficient to meet uh, water ice demands in the system, the overall picture is not great because of dry conditions in January. So uh, the red line there shows that uh, storage has, its peak has started to decline through January uh, as Lake Mendocino makes releases uh, to maintain in-stream flows uh, under a, a temporary urgency change petition approval that uh, the division issued on December 10th. And so releases from storage have been happening. Um, those releases will taper off a little bit starting today uh, as um, the, the flow requirements are evaluated monthly and defining the year type. Uh, but still concerning that we're on the drawdown and we really need a, a couple more storms. Um, otherwise, we'll be in a comparable situation to last year. Um, and next is Aaron Ragazzi to provide updates. Thanks, Sam. And, and I just know, uh, since we did have an opportunity to acknowledge the, the Russian River team here, that 92% uh, compliance rate um, is just, again, an a, a incredibly strong reflection of the trust and relationship that you have all built with folks in the watershed and just really appreciate it. Thanks. Good morning, Chair Escavel and members of the board, Aaron Ragazzi. Um, I'm with the Division of Water Rights and I'm here to provide a short update on the Scott and Chasta. So first, the curtailment status on the Scott. Um, curtailments are currently suspended as long as flows remain greater than the 200 CFS flow requirement. And the Shasta flows are also suspended at this time through the end of February, as long as 
flows remain above the 135 CFS flow requirement. Additionally, um, there's a requirement for folks to work with the Scott Valley and Shasta Valley Water Master uh, District there. Um, we've been very fortunate to work with that water master there who has a really good understanding of the system. Additionally, the prohibition on inefficient livestock diversions is over as of um, today. That prohibition was put in place to help protect the migration of the salmon moving into the system in both watersheds. And it automatically lifted for the Scott today, it lifted in the Shasta on January 21st through an order that was issued by the board. Next slide, please. I did want to mention something a little new that hasn't been in the past drought updates relative to the Scott and the Shasta. Um, contracts under the uh, expedited provisions that are provided under the governor's proclamation are in place um, moving forward. So on the Scott Valley and Shasta Valley Watermaster District, um, that contract has been approved by the Department of Finance and the Watermaster is now able to commence work as of earlier last week. Uh, we are working on the scope of work for the University of California at Davis contract. That's to have modeling done on the surface water, groundwater uh, side of things in the Scott Valley watershed. So hoping we can get that one underway in the near terms as well. We continue to meet with interested parties on the potential for local cooperative solutions that are available under the emergency regulation that would provide for folks to um, not receive curtailment orders if they have approved local cooperative solutions. And we continue to work on approving petitions for human health and safety, livestock watering, and in-stream uses. Next slide, please. Uh, just a little graphic. It's getting busier and busier as we're moving forward um, on the Scott River. Um, as I mentioned, the required flow for February is 200 CFS. That's the same for January, and that's the same for March. So these early months of the year, consistently 200 CFS. Um, we had flows of 253 CFS um, late last week. We have since seen them drop. Um, they are in the 230 range, I think 233 this morning uh, CFS. So we're monitoring those pretty closely as we start to potentially approach uh, 200 CFS. And um, those curtailments are suspended contingent on those flows being maintained, as I mentioned earlier at the Fort Jones gauge. I do wanna mention that um, CDFW has pulled out their monitoring for the migration and has recently put in rotary screw traps in these systems and will be monitoring out migration of salmonids. They're putting those reports together and we should have an update on those um, at the coming board meeting. Next slide, please. So the Shasta River, same thing, 135 CFS is the January, February and March flow requirement. Uh, flows as of last week were 152 CFS, and those are suspended through the end of February. And then that covers it for the Scott Shasta update. I'm going to move on to the next slide, please, which shows how people can stay informed about all of these various drought efforts that the board has ongoing. Really want to encourage folks to sign up for these email subscription lists based upon whatever watersheds they're interested in and to visit our drought web page frequently for updates. Next slide, please. DDW, the Division of Drinking Water has no updates today, which means we're gonna turn it over to um, the Division of Financial Assistance unless there are any questions for us. Well, just as we do that, I just want to acknowledge, you know, I know we've had an opportunity to, um, you know, uh, provide superior accomplishment awards for the Delta team, the Russian River team, and the Scott and the Shasta team is, is high on, uh, the, the, the list of folks that really need to be thanked for also just incredible work. Um, no small um, uh, feat that um, we've been able to work along with communities to really uh, um, respond in the Scott and the Shasta, but I want to acknowledge that modeling contract. Um, and here, uh, just a quick question, Aaron, I imagine it is, but um, it, checking to see if it's just really a, a continuum of the good modeling work that we have been doing uh, for a, a few years now um, with the GSA, with Davis, and with others to understand the complex you know, surface and groundwater interactions that happen uh, there in the basin. Um, and, and, you know, and, and if so, if it is a, a continuation of that work, just to acknowledge um, that it's, uh, it's been uh, 
you know, incredible to see the, the growth of that trust and the work, uh, this joint modeling included that we've been able to do with uh, folks out in the community. So the modeling that we've been doing in the Scott Shasta region has mainly been focused on the Shasta River up to date. So under the California Water Action Plan, we've been working with uh, Siskiyou County um, on surface water groundwater modeling efforts and trying to make sure we're on the same page moving forward. This um, new contract will allow us to work on surface water groundwater information in the Scott River watershed, um, which is important to support the ongoing drought efforts and um, I think long-term request for flow information and um, work that we've received from CDFW and others. Great, glad to hear we're, we're able to expand over to the, to the Scott. Thank you, I appreciate it, Aaron. All right, uh, good morning, Chair Esquivel morning. and fellow board members. My name is Matt Pavelcheck. I am a senior engineering geologist over the cleanup and abatement account and emergency drinking water unit with the Division of Financial Assistance. And today I will be providing a brief update on drought related funding. Next slide, please. So this map <clears throat> shows all of our urgent drought projects that we have committed funding to since July 1st. It's a total of 14 projects for just under $2 million. And as a reminder, we are continuing to coordinate closely with our colleagues at the Department of Water Resources who also receive drought funding on urgent drought response, as well as the development of county level or regional scale programs to assist those served by state smalls and domestic wells that have gone dry. Next slide, please. So this map shows the state water board funded existing regional and statewide programs that could help with drought response for services such as well repairs and replacements or the provisions for bottled and hauled water. There's just about $49 million in funding available under these programs. And additionally, we have technical assistance that is provided across the state through a number of funding agreements with various technical assistance providers. These TA agreements could potentially also assist with drought related issues and there's still approximately $54 million remaining in those programs and more information on, on the technical assistance and these other regional programs is available on our web page. Uh, next slide, please. So today I wanted to share a little more information regarding one of our regional programs with self help enterprises and that is our dry well tanks and hauled water program which is a critical piece of our drought related funding response in the Central Valley. The photo on the slide shows a tank that was installed at a household uh, with a dry well, and the map shows the locations of all the households that are currently enrolled in the program with self-help enterprises. The purpose of this program is to purchase and install tanks for households that are dealing with a failed or dry well. We currently have 786 households enrolled in the program as of January 2022. It costs approximately $5,500 per household to purchase and install the tanks, and then these can be reinstalled as households exit the program as well. In terms of water delivery costs, the hauled water costs right around 22 cents per gallon, which amounts to $977 per household per month to provide them with an adequate hauled water supply. And that adds up to approximately $770,000 per month, $770,000 per month based on our current enrollment numbers. And then uh, I did also want to note that on January 25th, uh, last month, an amendment to the program was approved by our deputy director, which added an additional $12 million in funding to the program. Next slide, please. This slide just summarizes our drought funding activity since July 1st. Uh, we've committed funding to five urgent repair projects, plus an additional 10 emergency projects through self-help enterprises program for a combined total of just about $1.9 million. And we've added an additional $34.8 million to our existing regional programs. And we've provided interim solutions to 10 communities so far that are specifically related to drought issues, providing assistance to over 7,500 people. Next slide, please. We're going into a 
bit more detail. Um, we didn't approve any requests for urgent drought projects or requests through the self-help emergency fund program in January 2022. Again, just to note on January 25th, an amendment to the self-help dry well and tanks and hauled water program was approved for an additional $12 million of funding. And then in terms of our county programs, between the State Water Board and DWR, we are still in discussions with about 15 interested counties, and we are currently working closely with Imperial, Santa Cruz, San Bernardino, and Yolo counties to assist them with developing programs. Next slide, please. Today, I also wanted to quickly highlight our bottled water for schools program that's implemented by RCAC. The photo shows a bottled water dispenser that's installed at one of the schools enrolled in the program. This is a statewide bottled water program that allows for the purchase and delivery of bottled drinking water for public schools until a long-term or other interim solution is in place for each site. This program has been in place since May of 2020, and currently there are 41 schools enrolled. On January 21st, our deputy director approved a two-year extension to this program that included just over $479,000 in additional funding. And this will allow DFA to continue to respond to water quality and drought related impacts to schools throughout the state. Next slide, please. And lastly, these are just some links to various drought related funding resources and I'm available for any questions that you guys may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Pavelcheck, for the good overview of the work that's ongoing. I know that um, there's continued uh, discussion right now around just scenario planning as well, kind of mapping out uh, worst case scenario, if you will, if things remain dry for and finding ourselves then in the summer and trying to project out what are the resources we need, what uh, what are the issues that we may see given our experience just this last summer with challenges around um, shortages on um, hold water tanks and, and other uh, critical supplies. So I just want to call attention that I know those discussions are ongoing and it's a really important continua continuum uh, from this um, you know, funding that we're, we're able to um, be able to respond with. And you know, very different from the last route in the speed in which we were able to respond because of the existing program. So just thank you for the great work that DFA continues to do here and appreciate the um, continued planning and discussions that are ongoing to best prepare us for uh, a future uh, moment this summer where we're needing to, again, uh, likely be responding to communities. So thank you. Any questions though, from fellow colleagues or comments? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Mr. Pavelcheck. Uh, with that, uh, I think we can uh, then conclude item number two and uh, move on here then to item number three. Uh, which is an update on monthly water production and conservation data reported by urban water retail suppliers. Uh, Chair, Chair well, we'll we have... oh. Go ahead, Ms. Townsend. Oh, do we, we have, have a, a commenter? Two, we have two, yes. I apologize. I didn't see them here. I'd only seen previously the, the urban water commenters. Um, apologize. We're not done with uh, item number two. Uh, let's go to our speaker cards. We have two speakers and the first uh, is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Salomone. Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, the last time I came on and gave you an update, I failed to mention where I'm calling in from, <laughs> although some of you may have known. Um, I'm calling in from the Mendocino County Russian River Flood Control and Water Conservation Improvement District. Um, we work closely with Sonoma Water Agency in um, managing the stored water and releases from Lake Mendocino. We're also working very closely with the Russian River um, Drought Response Team that you so beautifully um, honored this morning. I just wanted to come on and say, we, we couldn't have done it without them. They have been amazing. Um, they've, they've really offered a lifeline to our region. Um, we, have, we have people and entities that are communicating and cooperating that have never done so before. Um, and if that's all that comes from this, that is a wonderful thing. But I think we're really close to having some results in the voluntary conservation um, program. Um, Eric wasn't here this morning, but he's part of that team. Um, and, I, and I know you all know how hard he works and how dedicated he is and leads his team so well. 
So thank you to everyone from many departments in the state that have assisted the Russian River watershed in Mendocino County this year. Um, I personally and my district, we greatly appreciate it and look forward to continuing that work. Um, Sam, you did a great job this morning in um, sharing the situation. Yes, we, we have the curtailments lifted at the moment or suspended rather, but uh, we are looking at some very dry conditions and very concerned about the coming year and the years to follow. Um, so I look forward to continuing uh, my relationship with working with the State Water Board and hoping we can all navigate this um, together. Thank you very much. Thank you for just your incredible leadership uh, this past summer and throughout the years uh, in the watershed. Uh, it has made an incredible difference, I know, in our ability to respond well here and continue to have, yes, difficult conversations and, and yes, uh, disagreement. Um, but uh, in a way that I, I, I feel confident that we can continue to uh, just do better by uh, the administration of water rights, but also the faith and trust of water rights holders in uh, the decisions that are, are being made and, and being able to all look at the same data and information and, and really be able to, to bring ourselves here into the 21st century. I strongly feel um, the Russian River watershed is, is really ready for that moment, um, given the investments in forecast and form reservoir operations, given just, again, to your point, the, the commitment um, of the community that we've seen to, to really uh, get in there and, and dig into what are, again, some longstanding challenges and, and issues. But um, if not, if we don't figure them out now, they continue to be stumbling blocks to, to good management and drought and the, climate, the challenges that climate change are bringing to us. So just thank you for those, those comments and importantly, uh, your great leadership. Um, can't, we can't do it without, so thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Eric Oriana. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Good morning, uh, board members and staff. My name is Eric Oriana. Uh, some of you may know, and I'm a policy advocate with Community Water Center. I wanted to share a, a, just a quick comment, uh, but before that, I wanted to highlight that last year, Community Water Center submitted a comment letter highlighting the need to proactively prepare for drought impacts, and we uh, recommend you all take a, a, just another look again. Uh, but wanted to just come here and say that we're really supportive uh, that the governor has set aside funds to be flexible to respond to the drought impacts that, that we may be seeing uh, later this year. Uh, but the state definitely needs to be flexible to drought impacts, but it also needs to prioritize sustainable long-term solutions. Uh, and we wanted to also highlight that hundreds of households, uh, as was shared earlier today, are on, on the state in the state are relying on water haulers to bring water for their families on a bi-weekly basis. Uh, this is essential to provide for communities' current needs, uh, but it is not ideal for the state to be relying on trucks to haul water. Uh, the trucks used to haul water emit harmful emissions that exacerbate climate change and drought conditions in the state. Furthermore, households who need domestic well repairs are having to wait far too many months. Agricultural wells are being prioritized because installing or repairing ag wells is generally more lucrative than installing or repairing domestic wells. Uh, we urge the state to work to find ways to get domestic wells uh, prioritized for uh, well drilling, uh, rather than those who can pay more uh, because they are over pumping aquifers to increase their profits at the expense of communities. Uh, we would also like the state to consider how we can be more proactive by committing resources now to procuring supplies needed to address the drought emergency we will likely face in the summer, including pre-positioning bottled water and tanks in areas where we can expect impacts to be felt the most. And lastly, I'd like to share that the board uh, needs to work with the Department of Water Resources in their development of domestic well impact mitigation program guidance to GSAs, uh, which will be released in May. Uh, specifically, the board needs to clarify that drought impacts caused by chronic lowering the groundwater tables, and undesirable result identified in Sigma, need to be billed to the GSAs, which have failed to mitigate for such impacts. I uh, appreciate you all uh, allowing me to share some comments with you all this morning uh, and uh, looking forward to continuing to work uh, with you all closely in the rest of the year. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oriana. Really appreciate uh, the good constructive uh, feedback, comments, and look forward to, yes, uh, a lot more work here uh, in the months ahead. And um, just to, to flag, I think, um, I know our folks at the Division of Financial Assistance are already in discussion with self-help about pre-positioning uh, bottled water, at least and uh, definitely are, are exploring how we best 
uh, whether it's tanks or, or other resources, um, prepare ourselves for what we know uh, will be coming this summer, given what we saw this last and if things remain dry. So really appreciate the, the good comment. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, apologize for um, uh, nearly cutting off early here, our commenters. Um, but with that, I think we're concluded with item number two, unless there's anything um, fellow board colleagues here would like to say or add. Okay, hearing none, uh, we can now move on to item number three, in earnest, uh, which is our update on monthly water production and conservation data reported by urban retail water suppliers. Good to see you, uh, Ms. Rodero. Good morning. morning. All right. Good morning, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. My name is Marielle Rodero, and I will be providing the urban water conservation update for December 2021. Next slide, please. I think we all remember the storms that uh, happened last month um, and we've seen definitely some benefits. Um, so in contrast to October where the storms mainly hit the northern part of the state, this time it was statewide. Um, this is one of the wettest Decembers we've seen since 2014 as is evident by the color of the bars in the figure. The wet conditions caused a 13 GPCD drop relative to last year and um, brings this year's residential use in line with other recent December numbers with a residential per capita use rate of 65 GPCD statewide. Next slide, please. The similarities between October and December are also seen in the dramatic jump in savings relative to the previous month. December is the first month that statewide savings has broken 15% in the short term. This brings statewide cumulative savings from July to December up to 7.4%. This does come with the caveat that December 2020 was extremely dry compared to 2021, so usage was up last year, as we saw in the previous slide. The rain in December was a major contributor to resultant savings, as there was much less outdoor irrigation happening. However, we can still be encouraged by this month's numbers because it means that Californians are being mindful of local conditions and adjusting their habits accordingly. Next slide, please. December um, did see a reversal of the October trend where the highest savings were concentrated in the northern part of the state this time. The central and south coast regions, as well as Tulare Lake and South Lahontan, all had regional savings of over 15%. Next slide, please. The emergency regulation that the board adopted on January 4th is now in effect and will be for the next year. It prohibits certain wasteful water use practices statewide and encourages Californians to monitor their water use more closely while building habits to use water wisely. Summarized here are five of the requirements, turn off decorative fountains, don't irrigate when it's raining, use an automatic shutoff nozzle, use a broom to clean hardscapes and don't overwater. For a full list, um, go to our emergency regulation webpage. Um, in drought or not, our conservation tip for this month is for Californians to abide by these measures as well as others addressed by the regulation. The easiest and most helpful way a person may report water waste is by going to um, savewater.ca.gov. Next slide, please. Finally, we'd just like to remind our audience that Save Our Water campaign does offer free and publicly available resources on its website to spread the word about the importance of conserving water during a drought. Um, there is a general campaign and then two others focused on Latinx and Asian American communities. With that, I am done with my presentation and I will open uh, up, I will, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much. Um, I know these, these monthly reports on where we are on conservation can seem something of a roller coaster where, you know, it's, you know, have we meet, met a target at the 15% request? Where are we in comparison to last year? And we see, of course, how, how much uh, the actual hydrology dictates that uh, when it's wet, we have more opportunity to save, we see better numbers. 
Uh, but, but generally what we've seen is uh, an activation of conservation and an ethic of conservation here in the state that has carried over. We have to importantly acknowledge from the last drought as well, where we're still seeing 15% uh, savings from um, um, last droughts numbers, let alone the increase in conservation we've seen since the governor's call this last summer. Um, but it's, it's uh, and very encouraging to continue to see uh, these, these trends in conservation in the state, not just for the importance to drought response that we know it is, and here thinking of the Russian River watershed, um, which you know, isn't connected to the state water project or any major projects and are, are left with the resources they have within the watershed to manage through. And we saw incredible conservation uh, numbers, you know, 40, 50 upwards percent um, here in, in communities because of needing to respond to those dire conditions. So, you know, we see a need to respond in drought with conservation, certainly, but it seemed it, what's important now is it's less even about are we in drought or not, especially a year like this, where we've seen incredibly wet December and, and a feeling of maybe drought conditions easing. But um, I think the reality is that uh, whether it's drought or floods, we're, we're seeing these extremes um, happen almost overlapping and, and is why it's less about uh, conservation because of drought conditions and really just building in efficiency um, in, as a core um, for, for the state's water supply. Um, and here, yes, also needing to respond to conditions with, you know, um, with drastic and sometimes uh, in some cases conservation, uh, I think of Marin and other uh, communities as well. So um, all that to, to say, um, yes, it can kind of seem an up and down, on these monthly numbers, but the trends that we're seeing are incredibly encouraging, and we're going to need this conservation. Um, as we said, you know, we're looking to to hopefully uh, get a few more storms here this this uh, water year, but the storm door may be closed. Um, and so, you know, having booted up this conservation, having Californians be mindful, so mindful of their use going into this next summer, will be uh, just very important. So, uh, great to see these numbers um, and. Uh, and incredibly impressive. And again, uh, also reflective of the opportunity to conserve uh, when things are wet. Um, I don't think I have any, uh, any questions. It'll be um, interesting to see now here as a contrast because January was so dry, what our numbers look like uh, and there help get a, a sense of, of where we are um, as a state as we drive to ensure we're, we're conserving as best we can given the stresses um, that this drought are uh, presenting, not just within our own borders, I think of also the, the Colorado River and uh, the other basin states we share like need and that critical resource with, you know, just so important to continue to conserve and show that we're doing our part uh, to help contribute to uh, what are, you know, certainly challenging circumstances that climate change is posing for us. Uh, any questions or uh, comments from uh, fellow board colleagues? Okay, hearing none then I think that uh, I can wrap up this item. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rodero, really appreciate it. Oh, and it doesn't actually, because we have commenters and I apologize for now a second time trying to uh, not, not go to them. Let's first, uh, we have three commenters here uh, on the list. And first I have up uh, Alyssa Abbey. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alyssa Abbey, and I'm the staff analyst at Soquel Creek Water District. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our experience. Uh, our region in Santa Cruz County is not connected to the state water project, and we are 100% reliant on local groundwater to serve our customers. And the groundwater basin we utilize is considered critically overdrafted and is experiencing seawater intrusion. So as a result, we long ago implemented aggressive water conservation programs, um, permanent water waste restrictions, and a program for water neutral development as we pursue supplemental supply. And as a result of our conservation, uh, water use fell drastically in 2015 uh, to approximately 25% below 2013 usage. And since then, the district has continued with our generous rebate rebate program, uh, water audits, uh, water waste enforcement, and have continued to deepen our commitment to conservation with uh, robust leak detection and other improvements. And we have remained in a stage three water shortage emergency 
due to groundwater overdraft since 2014. And so as a result in 2020, our usage was still low and had never significantly rebounded from the lows that were experienced in the previous drought. And we continue to have one of the lowest GPCDs in the state. So cutting usage in 2021, a further 15% uh, was very difficult and um, didn't give us any credit for the significant reductions we had maintained in the quote unquote non-drought years. Uh, and so we feel that the blanket conservation goals do not recognize the different challenges that are currently being faced by groundwater reliant agencies like ours, uh, which aren't as directly impacted by rainfall. And um, we're currently already addressing our water shortages through groundwater sustainability plans. And so um, and we just wanted to comment to kind of urge that any future enforcement of drought conservation targets consider these factors and to avoid a blanket application to all urban water suppliers. So, um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Abby, really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for the local leadership I know that has driven conservation incredibly uh, in the region. Uh, do know that uh, the 15% target that the governor set statewide is to be able to set a metric and a goal and to reach for it and isn't meant to be applied just generally to, to water agencies because especially as we develop our long-term efficiency regulations, very understanding that many uh, different water agencies are at different places and many an agency is actually uh, conserving and, and isn't needing to conserve further if we're looking at the sort of standards that we're setting. I think important to note in the last drought as well that um, although I think the board started at a, you know, a, a blanket, if you will, uh, percentage uh, application or reduction, it, it, it wasn't where the board uh, left off the way it uh, enforced mandatory conservation in the last drought and very much uh, reflected a uh, stress test and otherwise left the many agencies alone. Um, so, so do know that, and appreciate the, 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 um, the points and hear the, the desire to not see a, a blanket uh, cut across all agencies, um, certainly not moving in that, uh, that, that, that firm direction that way. And importantly um, here, uh, the 15% uh, goal statewide isn't meant to just uh, apply blanket to, to each uh, agency, but uh, I appreciate the, 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 nod, the nod to the great conservation that's been going on in the community and would note, it's not just about conservation that we have to be mindful of, it's also investing in, in the projects that will continue to build supply resilience. And want to thank the uh, Soquel Creek for the leadership around their uh, water recycling project um, that is, I know, contributing to um, help with that overdraft of groundwater, but also seawater intrusion. So um, thank you. I do appreciate the, the good points, Ms. Abby. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Jeff uh, Stephenson. Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and members of the board. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to comment. My name is uh, Jeff Stevenson, and I'm a water resources manager with the San Diego County Water Authority. I wanna let the board know that the Water Authority continues to take actions to increase water use efficiency in our area. Last week, we added contract capacity to two of our programs for disadvantaged communities. Uh, these programs are run in partnership with San Diego Gas and Electric. For the first program, it's a water energy nexus program. We expanded the contract capacity by $1.8 million and extended the contract for four more years. For the second program, the Energy Savings Assistance Program, we increased the contract capacity by $400,000. These programs offer water efficient devices such as high efficiency clothes washers to qualified customers at no cost and that includes installation. And that concludes my comments. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. I appreciate. I know the the investments that a lot of a uh, number of water agencies are making, and uh, here in the governor's budget, uh, proposed to also help uh, contribute to conservation uh, through uh, both uh, outdoor rebates and internal. So, really appreciate the. I know the good investments that a number of agencies, including San Diego Water Authority, are are making uh, on on and to to drive uh, these really critical conservation goals. So, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Remlet uh, Scherzinger. Good morning, Chair Escobel, board and staff and public. Uh, my name is Rem Scherzinger. I'm the general manager here at Marina Coast Water District. So greetings from Monterey Bay. 
um, and it looks like the Central Coast. So um, just really quickly, uh, over the past 25 years, Marina Coast has invent, invested heavily in a comprehensive and kind of overreaching, I would say, uh, conservation program um, that has yielded uh, a 21 percent savings over our 2013 targets within our water shortage contingency plan over that period. Um, and we've been in a constant state of, uh, or we've been operating within that contingency plan since 2014, given our ground, that we are a groundwater organization. Beyond that, uh, we've invested with our other regional partners, roughly $88 million in our recycled water program. And we're now tooling up a multi-million dollar AMI program, which will have the necessary cloud-based customer focused uh, infrastructure so that we can interact on a one-to-one -one with our customers. We're very excited about that. Um, for those board members and staff that don't necessarily know our region, Marina Coast uh, took over the water system for the former Fort Ord. And so we are experiencing a significant amount of development here on the Monterey Bay, which through our conservation efforts, but also through development uh, review and new fixtures and appliances being put into those homes, uh, we've been able to maintain a 13% thir reduction on production of water that we were experiencing prior to development. So a significant opportunity uh, for us to grow as an organization, but also to share knowledge that we've developed as we've gone into this space. So with that, we've also married our conservation group with our customer service group. And so um, they're actually working in tandem now, something that we hadn't had in, in years past where Conservation sat on one side and they were doing school work and changing sprinklers and doing big projects. We now have customer service, identifying customers, shedding those customers into our customer service unit and our customer service unit moving out and, and approaching the public. So uh, to echo our, our, our sister agency to the North SoCal Creek, we've been in this conservation mode for a long time. We appreciate the board's uh, support. And, and as you said, Chair Esquivel, you know, the fact that you're not looking at us uh, as a blanket and that you're that the board and, and the state are willing to look at us as unique entities all working hard to uh, conserve our resources. So uh, thank you for this opportunity, everybody. It was a pleasure seeing everybody this morning. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time and uh, addressing the board and, and sharing the important perspective um, here at Marina Coast. And, and thank you as well for, for making that connection uh, between conservation and housing. Um, you know, it, it's not lost as well. You know, you think of uh, the in Southern California, the Metropolitan Water uh, District Service Area, being able to add, uh, you know, four or five million uh, uh, service uh, customers uh, into the area, but uh, be still using um, the same or less water. You know, that 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 bolsters housing. That's a you know, uh, it makes and ensures that uh, conservation is is helping us. You know, complete multiple goals here. Uh, certainly in the face of, of the challenges our communities are facing. So I appreciate that. And thank you for your good comments. Thank you. Okay. I think we, that concludes our public commenters and uh, any further comment from uh, fellow board colleagues. Okay. Hearing none, then thank you everyone. And we can, that concludes item number three. Appreciate the good, um, uh, news certainly, and we can now move on to item number four, which is our Office of the Delta Water Masters periodic report. Good to see you this morning. Good morning, Chair Esquivel, members of the board. Um, I'm Michael George, and I'm pleased to be here to give my uh, regular report about the activities in our office. I'm particularly pleased today to precede Dr. Larson. Uh, last week, uh, Dr. Larson and I ta tag teamed uh, her. Uh, Delta Science report and my water master report only last week uh, before the Stewardship Council, she got to go first. It's much easier to lead than to follow her. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to be here this morning. Um, uh, next slide, please. This is kind of an overview of the items I'd like to uh, touch on today. Um, but I really think, and a lot of the discussion today uh, there's even an overview to the overview, which is about the importance of data in everything we do. It improves our understanding, gives us insight, leads to action. From that action, we continue to learn, and that's where we build trust 
so that we have more ability to do uh, maybe some more daring things that are going to be necessary as we adjust to uh, the new normal or the new uncertainty associated with climate change. So all of the, all of the things I wanna talk about today fit in that kind of overall context about how to use data to improve insight and understanding to inform actions that we take that we can then learn from and work together to build trust. So I'm gonna start with a discussion of where we are in implementing the Delta Alternative Compliance Plan, then talk about a, an exciting pilot program that just launched last week and that's already showing uh, uh, good uh, participation and uh, will lead to good results. And uh, I then want to talk about how we are proceeding in our investigation of a uh, complaint filed by export interests about unlawful diversion in the Delta. And then move on to the progress uh, that's being made in terms of master planning for the Southern Delta. Whereas I've reported uh, many times before, the acceleration of deterioration in the South Delta. And I really believe this master planning effort has the potential to arrest that deterioration and begin to restore uh, the Southern Delta. And then finally, I wanna talk about how all of these things lead to an understanding of the need and a path forward for building capacity in the Delta to set agenda and to make progress with state agencies, with our office, with the Division of Water Rights uh, and, and others. Next slide, please. So starting with implementation of the alternative compliance plan, uh, as, as you all recognize, um, at the end of the last route in 2015, the legislature gave us new authority to require measurement of diversions as a way of getting a better handle on water use throughout the, uh, uh, well, throughout the state. And particularly in the Delta watershed, um, as, as we, uh, moved to implementing the regulations that uh, your board adopted in 2016, we ran into a number of problems that we've talked about in prior reports. One of the things that that has done is allowed us to develop this alternative way of complying with the letter of that law. So even back in 2015, when that law kind of uh, around the notion that you couldn't manage what you weren't measuring and suggested therefore that we implement these regulations, which uh, we've done to either measure, uh, put a meter on every diversion or identify an alternative, uh, I'm sorry, a measurement method to uh, measure at the diversion or in certain circumstances where that proved impossible or uh, wasn't meeting the objectives, the uh, legislation and the regulation allowed for the development of an alternative compliance plan. And so after several years of experimentation, we pivoted to this alternative compliance plan. And through a long process, three or four years, we participated in the development of OpenET as a way of measuring the actual water use in the Delta. That is, primarily the evapotranspiration from crops. The use of water to grow crops in the Delta that takes that water out of the system. Now, I'm, I'm quick to acknowledge that there's also other water use in the Delta. Um, uh, there's a lot of open water in the Delta from which water evaporates once it enters the Delta. There's also a lot of riparian and natural vegetation that has uh, uh, evapotranspiration associated with it. And frankly, we need and expect and are building more of that because we call that uh, 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 recovery of some of the natural processes in the Delta. So aside from uh, looking at the, uh, the uh, evapotranspiration from crops, we're continuing to look at those other and account for those other uses of water in the Delta. But the one that is manageable is the application of water for crops 
and the evapotranspiration that uh, results from that. And so by using open ET and by gathering water users in the Delta through a voluntary consortium process, we're capturing and organizing data that is actually much more useful than what we have gotten in the past or what we could have gotten from putting a measurement device on every single diversion of the Delta, particularly because the Delta, uh, first of all, has fluctuating water levels as a result of tidal influence. Secondly, there's a lot of debris in the water, a lot of uh, invasive weeds, particularly hyacinth, that float in the water and get sucked up into uh, diversion structures, particularly siphons, which are largely used in the Delta. And uh, all of those factors, as well as, as others, have made it difficult to put a measuring device on every diversion, but given us the opportunity to look at more credible, more consistent, closer to real time information that we can use to understand and therefore manage water use in the Delta. This comes with the benefits of reduced costs on the individual water user, lower friction, and importantly in the Delta, very high uptake, very high acceptance of this alternative compliance plan. And so we are now in the implementation stage. The alternative compliance plan is in effect, has been in effect since the water year began on October 1st, and we'll get the first reports in February of uh, 2023 when those annual water use reports are due. But we're getting valuable data right now. OpenET is able to tell us at the field level what's going on with crop, with crop evapotranspiration. And so what we really got here in this implementation phase is a huge test at scale, not only of OpenET, but of the interaction between you know, sustainable farming and sustainable soil management practices with evapotranspiration from the crops. So it's an incredibly uh, exciting and uh, positive development uh, for the Delta. And I think uh, we're working very closely with our colleagues in the Division of Water Rights because ultimately the lessons that we learn in the Delta are going to have wide application throughout irrigated agriculture across California and indeed the West. So with that, I, just, I could go, go ahead. I, I, uh, I have to interrupt, of course, just to say um, thank you uh, incredibly for, for your work and leadership on this. Um, I, it has been um, just really heartening to see uh, this effort come together and to see so much support and to see so much of it driven as well by water users in the Delta uh, who are themselves saying, this is something that um, we are embracing as a tool and as an opportunity to lower the costs of being uh, complying with what are you know, an important regulation here, but also just to become better decision makers amongst themselves and here with us as well. Um, and it is just an incredible opportunity here. It can't be overstated um, how much it really is an opportunity and one that's been curated uh, by a, a number of leaders um, here at the board, but uh, particularly you, Mr. George, I just have to thank you. Um, it is uh, I'm just excited to see um, its application, certainly in you know, no, no small place, uh, the Delta um, here, uh, and no, no certainly less critical a place, uh, but the ability to export this then to other watersheds, to, to, for other water users, to similarly see uh, a lower cost tool um, here that, that ultimately gets us all to be better decision makers, um, I think is, is really incredible. So just thank you for, for shepherding this and bringing it to a point where here within the year, um, we'll be seeing a, a real-time application. And as we develop our new water rights data system, um, comes really well-timed to be able to really say, what, you know, what does the future of the administration of water rights look like on, on the data and the system side? And what are these tools like OpenET and remote sensing that are out there that can you know, dovetail with that uh, opportunity to really help accelerate us into the 21st century in a way that we've really lagged behind here in the state. So thank you. Well, that's, uh, that's great. And I appreciate the thanks, but as you say, it's a, it's a big team that's been working on this for a long time. And I agree completely with your 
notion that one of the great values here is the support of the water user community. They really bought into the need for better data to understand what was going on in the Delta and how uh, we could manage together rather than, you know, uh, simply uh, bring uh, supposed uh, uh, solutions, uh, you know, down from the mountaintop. So it's been exciting to work on. It's been a multi-year process and it is exciting to have it actually uh, implemented now. So actually building on that, going to the next slide, um, the, uh, this is a, a, a new program. It was just uh, launched uh, on January 18th and it is being administered by the Delta Conservancy under an interagency operations agreement but it brings together uh, in collaboration, water users in the Delta and multiple state agencies, uh, the Department of Food and Agriculture, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Department of Water Resources, the State Water Board, our office, Cal EPA, all collaborating to say, as we look at dry conditions, the potential for the persistence of this drought and the certainty of droughts in the future, how can we better figure out what kinds of responses we can put in place so that we're predictably able to respond to the inevitable droughts? How many times have we acknowledged that even though a drought uh, presents itself ultimately as an emergency, there are no emergency responses. You can't go out and, and uh, you know, flood fight or uh, fight the fire Etc. You really have to plan in advance, and so these agencies, recognizing that, came together and built this program. It's a grant program, as I say, administered by the Delta Conservancy, but it is a request to the uh, water user community in the Delta to say, bring us actions that you think make sense for managing drought in the Delta, in the hub of the water distribution system and in, the, and in a critical uh, environmental estuary and incentivize farmers to bring those ideas to us, to apply to this grant program and say, we'd like to try this. We don't know what the outcomes might be in terms of exactly how much water might be saved because in the Delta, as we've said, you don't experience drought as a lack of water. You experience drought as a risk to water quality. And so this program explicitly asks farmers to propose actions in the fields that they know best, in the circumstance that, that they have, in the midst of their profit-making operations, to tell us to apply to take actions that they believe will conserve water and protect water quality in the Delta. So again, it's information coming up to uh, the Delta Conservancy and then evaluated by a selection committee to try and spread this grant money. This is a budget money for drought preparedness around the Delta so that we take advantage of the fact or acknowledge the fact that the Delta is a lot of different places. It's not a monolith. And one action that might save water let's say in uh, uh, a relatively high elevation in the North Delta, the same action taken on a deeply subsided island in the Central Delta might have very different water conservation impacts and different water quality impacts. So that's why we're asking farmers who know their fields to come and make these uh, proposals to us. Um, we had the, uh, the, the uh, program launched on the 18th on the last Friday, the 28th, we had the selection committee on which I serve evaluate the first batch. We're doing this on a rolling basis so that we can, when there's a, a, a proposal made, we can respond quickly. And so at that meeting on the 28th, we moved two applicants from their applications into uh, the grant negotiation stage. Uh, um, Next Friday, we've got about 30 more that we're evaluating. 
So uh, first week we had two out of 15. Next week, we'll evaluate another uh, 30 and move this program along, uh, get the water out the door, get real things happening on the ground. And ultimately, we're going to score the effectiveness of these programs through OpenET. Because again, we're using the new tool that we've got to evaluate. So for instance, if someone was growing tomatoes on a field last year and agrees to uh, put a cover crop, triticale or safflower or something to reduce water use, we're going to use OpenET to do that uh, scoring. In addition to that, um, the uh, one of the collaborating departments, the Department of Water Resources, is uh, contracting with UC Davis to do a certain amount of in-field uh, ground truthing, which will, again, give us data not only about what's working, but also those correlations between the satellite imagery and the on-the-ground uh, eddy covariance uh, mechanisms for measuring ET. So this is really a program designed to capture data about what works where so that we can begin to plan for a future where if we come into a water year, such as water year 2022, when let's say we've had a couple of years of reduced deliveries, so our water reliability has been down, we've maybe got reservoirs that are at a lower level than we'd like them. What can we do at the beginning of a water year when we don't know what precipitation holds for us to proactively prepare for persistence of dry conditions. So um, I'll, I will be back to report more on this to you in my next report, but it's gotten off to a very good start. We've gotten a lot of cooperation. And again, that cooperation is because the Delta Water Agencies in conjunction with the state agencies have uh, uh, discussed this program as participants in its development not just explaining the new program that comes out of Sacramento. So with that, um, I go to the next slide, which is to give you an update on the investigation that our office is conducting jointly with the Division of Water Rights into a complaint filed by a group of exporters uh, alleging unlawful diversion of the Delta. So we've been involved in refining the basis on which that complaint was filed, which essentially was a mass balance analysis, an estimate of the water coming into the Delta, coupled with an estimate of the net Delta outflow to the Bay, coupled with an understanding and measurement of the water that's extracted from the Delta for export, and then looking at that residual as water use in the Delta, which according to the complaint, is more than the water rights in the Delta would sustain. So starting from that uh, mass balance approach, we've worked with the complainants to uh, reduce the range of uncertainty in all of those inputs, to recognize that there are additional inflows in the Delta uh, that don't, say, uh, uh, get measured at uh, uh, Freeport, that there are uh, diversions, that, that there are uh, contributions to the watershed before that, uh, and, and that uh, enter the watershed or enter the delta at different places. So we're working on refining those data sources so that we can refine this mass balance approach. And uh, in fact, we have our next technical meeting among the Division of Water Rights, our office, and the complainants, um, I, I forget the date, sometime uh, next week. As we're doing this, moving to the second box on the top here, we're improving water use data generally. And so we're working on eliminating duplicate reporting because that duplicate reporting, once it gets into our eRIM system, makes it look like there's more water use than is physically happening. When you report water use, let's say under a license, and then individuals within the island where that license has its place of use, they're also reporting the same water through the same diversions for the same purpose again in July. So we've made 
uh, strides in fixing that problem. We got help from the legislature last year to bring all of the uh, water use reports into uh, synchronicity. <laughs> got them all to be reported at the same time. Don't mean to use those water words. Um, but we brought them into uh, the same uh, period and therefore improve the opportunity to, to correlate what's going on in the licenses with what's going on under the senior water rights that underlie many of those licenses. Um, we're also doing all the work that we've already described in terms of better measuring what's uh, actual use. And importantly, and this is the lower box, involving the complainants in every step of the way so that we improve mutual understanding between our office, the Division of Water Rights, the, the exporters, the users in the Delta, the upstream uh, uh, contributors to the watershed to get mutual understanding and therefore develop credibility in the results. And that's, as I said earlier, one of the things that really leads to building trust among entities that have a natural uh, tendency to say, I've got a problem, somebody else must be causing it. How much are they causing it? Where are the, where are the contributions, et cetera? So we're still in the, in the process here, no resolution yet, but I'm confident by the process that we're going through and the inclusiveness of that process, that when we come to conclusion, it'll have more credibility than, uh, than it might otherwise have if we just did a kind of closed door uh, analysis of the, of the complaint and then came out with either an enforcement action or a, uh, uh, a resolution on some other basis. So next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Go George, I just, Mr. George, just thank you for that update. And I'm just wondering about, you know, you're, you're providing these updates on the investigation, just wondering about general big picture timeline uh, in terms of when you might anticipate some sort of uh, conclusions. So um, uh, thanks for that question, because we are, we are uh, getting conclusions as we go along, but final resolution, I would hope um, uh, certainly before the 1st of June. Um, and, and final resolution may mean additional steps that need to be taken, but a resolution of the, the complaint on the basis that either identifying um, uh, unlawful diversions or identifying that uh, uh, there are no unlawful diversions or taking enforcement actions against the ones that we find. So um, I think we will have a resolving response to the complaint prior to June with actions based on that resolution, probably following uh, uh, for some time. Understood, thank you, appreciate that. So, um, so uh, speaking now about uh, one of the one of the really promising things uh, to resolve the, uh, the the nest of problems in the South Delta, some of which are pictured here, in terms of occlusion of the channels, uh, the uh, loss of uh, channel capacity, the uh, explosion of harmful algae bacteria, invasive weeds, the reduction is in dissolved oxygen, the interference with um, uh, recreational use of channels, the interference both with uh, agricultural irrigation from those channels, as well as uh, water supply for export or outflow. All of those problems uh, and, and overlain with the, the flood risk of occluded channels, all of that creates the problems that we've talked about in terms of accelerating deterioration. But it has also had the effect of bringing various different constituencies together. So if you care about fish, you care about low dissolved oxygen, you care about uh, channels that are dead ends for fish because of the siltation and, uh, and the growth of, of weeds. Uh, if you care about uh, uh, flood control, uh, those channel uh, problems are uh, obviously increase the risk of flood control. 
uh, if you care about agricultural irrigation. In other words, whatever your interest is in functionality of the South Delta, these problems, all which contribute to each other, uh, have brought a community of interest together that has resulted in the development of a community to build a master plan to recover functionality in the South Delta. Now, the locals cannot do this by themselves. They've got a lot of local knowledge. They understand, they see what's happening. They look at it, they've seen it over years as it's developed. They've made whatever accommodations they can make, but they understand that the problem that they are facing is bigger than they can solve. And so they've reached out to engage scientists who are primarily associated with state and federal agencies of one kind or another, and to bring that local knowledge and the scientific understanding together in a collaboration um, aimed at a common goal of recovering channel functionality, whether that function is just to move water, whether it's to reduce um, uh, flood risk, whether it's to allow for uh, fish passage, uh, whatever it is, the bigger goal, the, the notion here was to step back from the individual problems, make the problem bigger so as to bring more insight and resources to bear in solving it, to protect the critical infrastructure against the continued deterioration that threatens the very functionality of the Delta for whatever purpose it is. And because there are so many different agencies and so many different planning processes, I mean, think of our uh, water quality control planning process, um, the uh, um, Delta Plan Stewardship Council, the uh, uh, Collaborative Science Adaptive Management Planning process, the uh, uh, COA, the uh, Cooperative Operations uh, Agreement between the state and federal projects, the Interim Operations Agreement, all of these planning processes. One of the things we're trying to do through a mass, uh, through a master planning process is to cross pollinate those planning processes so that they can learn from each other. And so that a solution on one side doesn't either ignore or exacerbate a problem that is collateral. And so out of this is coming the development of true multi-benefit processes. Everybody recognizing that a flood control project needs to take account of the channel capacity issue, needs to take account of the age of infrastructure, the fragility of some of the uh, levees, the need to recover uh, uh, boating, recreation, and so forth, and to find projects that have sufficient scope to deal with and to provide, to deal with multiple problems and provide multiple benefits. And along the way to empower a regional response rather than a, a one size fits all Delta as a monolith uh, response. So we're making progress on this still early stages. Great credit to the division of, or, or the Department of Water Resources for making a planning grant, a $3 million grant um, which in the scheme of things is not a lot of money, but it's a huge amount of upfront demonstration of uh, confidence and credibility for the Department of Water Resources to make a grant to locals saying here, get your act together and come and tell us how we can help. That's a big, big shift. And I wanna give uh, Director Nemeth and the whole team at uh, the division of, or the Department of Water Resources great credit for making that investment to more or less prime the pump and get this master planning process started. Now, as these master plans develop, obviously there's going to be a need for a lot more money and a lot more cooperation. But this is the building block, just as if we go back to uh, 2015 when we had a voluntary water conservation program in the Delta, which we built on to, to help bring people along on open ET and uh, better measurement and, and so forth. I think of this as a building block that is going to pay real big dividends as it, as it 
gains momentum, credibility, and trust along the way. And so I want to go to my last slide now, which is about this process of building capacity within the Delta. And I think um, we've made progress here, but it's still uh, in the starting phase. How do you establish a unified voice for the Delta that yet respects the regional distinctions within the Delta? And one of the, one of the ways you do that is to step back, find out where the commonalities in the problem lie, and then to describe those commonalities and see if you can build a community of solution interests. And so we're working hard on that process, thinking all the time about how do you connect our planning and our adaptation efforts and our funding for resilience? How do we create a positive, respectful feedback loop so that uh, whether it's the Stewardship Council or the Water Board or the Department of Water Resources has a way to connect with credible voices in the Delta to help develop common solutions. And part of that process is a kind of sociological willingness to recognize that we disagree about a lot and we may even be suing each other in one forum, but to, but to keep viable other forums where we can work together, where we can understand each other's problems and enable the Delta to both set and advance its own priorities, rather than have those priorities dictated through these various well-meaning, well-resourced, well-planned efforts at the state level. And it allows for the creation of both credible information to come from our leading scientists and, and so forth to the Delta users in a way that they can understand it and use it, as well as inform those scientists or those managers at the state or federal level about what works at the local level. And so one of the things that we've discovered, duh, is that the Delta has lacked the ability to organize itself to prioritize multi-benefit projects, to write the grant applications that are necessary to draw funding to enable those multi-benefit projects to move forward from a conceptual stage to a planning stage to a permitting stage and ultimately to an implementation stage all along the way it depends on capacity in the delta to develop the uh, insights the concepts to, to prioritize them and to move them forward then should the Delta's capacity develop to the point where they get those grants, there needs to be an entity that can faithfully administer those grants to comply with the requirements in those grants, to write the reports about what we've learned from those projects, and then to make sure that there is a maintenance effort on an ongoing basis, because we've got too many circumstances where we had upfront money, let's say bond money to do something, but no budget to maintain it over time. And so by empowering capacity in the Delta, we hope not only to get better projects, more cooperation, better interaction between our various efforts, but a commitment within the Delta to help maintain these uh, projects and development. So this is uh, early capacity building. I want to give a lot of credit to the uh, Delta Stewardship Council, particularly their uh, decision to create a, uh, uh, a, a social science arm to go with their physical science arm to coordinate a lot of this investigation and uh, to bring on and hire Dr. Jessica Rez Redneck who's managing that part of their process. So again, early stage development, watch this space. It's where we're going to see an enormous uh, uh, flowering of response and input from Delta water users, from people who live in the Delta, people who visit and recreate in the Delta, uh, trying to come together to create uh, uh, real solutions.
And with that on the last slide, I'm open to questions and uh, uh, delighted, I hope, to have set the stage for what uh, some of Dr. Larson is going to want to talk about in her lead scientist report to follow. Really appreciate it, Mr. George. Just a great overview of a lot of incredible work that um, certainly, given the drought and the conditions we found uh, this last year, comes well timed. Um, you know, this is the, and and know that you know, whether it's the alternative compliance plan or uh, any of this, um, you know, new um, real coordination work, it's been years in the making. And I think what we have is just an incredible opportunity to just start doing a lot more, uh, given the 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 years of work that have gone on to things like the the ACP. So just thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate again the, the incredible uh, leadership that has been a allowing um, these, these projects to really come to fruition. Well, and thank you as well for the consistent support of the entire board for uh, these actions, because it takes resources, it takes commitment over time, and that can only be sustained uh, with your sustained support. So uh, but my team and the constituents in the Delta really appreciate the consistency that we've, we've had uh, from the entire board. Thank you. Looking to my fellow colleagues, Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, yes, I just want to thank you as well. It's I really always look forward to these reports um, because we always see some progress, some amount of progress. And you said it best. These are building blocks and um, building um, not just uh, local capacity, but that trust that is just so valuable to uh, your efforts, our efforts, and um, uh, the efforts within the Delta. So just a couple of questions, you may have mentioned this, but um, on the alternative compliance plan and then also the master plan, uh, the funding source and um, the amount. Um, right. And you know, any what's the prospect for ongoing funding for these programs? Because as we know, in particular on alternative compliance, you know, we're gonna be seeing more and more droughts more frequently. Um, and then uh, the other thing, I, just a suggestion at some point, I would sure love to, um, a, on an information item, maybe have you pull together some Delta leaders that would welcome the opportunity to appear before us and, um, you know, kind of give us sort of a local flavor, you know, on their thoughts about um, it, any of these um, initiatives. Uh, well, thank you for both those questions, and I'll take them in, in that order. In terms of the funding for the Delta ACP, um, uh, there is not a nickel of state uh, uh, funding yet. Um, all of this has been done by uh, water users in the Delta and by a collaboration of other funding agencies, particularly OpenET. That was a four year development process with a large consortium of academic institutions really around the world, um, uh, NASA and its uh, uh, satellite program, uh, several universities here in, in California uh, and led by the Environmental Defense Fund, which went out and raised about eight and a half million dollars from philanthropic organizations, the Walton Family Fund, the Stephen uh, Beckwell Jr. Fund, and others who were willing to, to, if you will, prime the pump to recognize that the science was there, but we needed to develop the way to bring that, you know, science from the laboratory into the field, and and that's where OpenET came from. So. Number one, an eight and a half million dollar uh, budget to develop it that was wonderfully successful. Secondly, obviously, you can only do satellite imaging if you've got satellites. And so we're not paying out of pocket for those satellites, but obviously government uh, uh, provided uh, the, the satellites that we're now using every day to estimate and, uh, evapotranspiration in the Delta. But the Delta water agencies themselves, number one, made contributions along with those uh, uh, foundations uh, into OpenET. So they had skin in the game from the beginning. And that was critical to having them paying attention, feeling like they were 
investors and were invested in the outcome and success of uh, what became Open ET. Uh, they are now funding that. Uh, uh, they, uh, the Central and South Delta Water Agencies uh, assessed their own members to fund the software development, hired a, uh, an independent uh, software developer, Habitat 7, to make the connections between our legacy report management system and Open ET and make it you know, accessible on a farmer's uh, iPhone uh, as, or, or computer, or what have you. Um, so the total cost of this has been underwritten by the Delta Water users themselves. And the cost per acre, uh, 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 enrolled acre in the program is a little under $1.70 per acre for the first year. That includes a 20%, uh, I'm sorry, a 20 cent per acre uh, licensing agreement with OpenET to have a, a, a specifically designed application programming interface with OpenET the water board is providing the application interface to the report management system on our dollar, the Department of, the Department of Information Technology, our office and uh, Division of Water Rights have all worked with the Office of Information uh, Management and Analysis. So there has been a contribution, it's been a soft contribution to create that interface between our report management system but the program itself has a built-in mechanism for maintaining it and upgrading it. So first year, $1.70, including 20 cents to open ET. The following year, the estimate is 40 cents per acre plus the 20 cents. So it'll be half the cost in the second year. And then the Delta has a built-in incentive to maintain and upgrade and develop this program because they know that we're moving to eRIMS 3.0, the new updated uh, uh, report management system. And they're committed to making the investments in the Delta ACP in order to keep up with and to maintain that interface. And we've already found that by working with the IT and OEMA and uh, our office and DWR, we've already found uh, things that we're saying to ourselves, oh, write this down. We need to make sure this is a functionality in the new system that we're at the early stage of designing conceptually. So this is a fully funded program with uh, a not too high a cost on, the, on water users and huge benefits to them. And we've made the point all the way along that a buck 70 per acre is leveraging millions of dollars that have come from other places. So encouraging them to cooperate with us at a burden that they can sustain for a benefit that they share. So that's the answer about ongoing funding. Secondly, uh, the invitation to bring Delta leaders. I'm, I am delighted with that uh, uh, suggestion. And uh, the next time I come before you for a water use report, I'll reduce the extent of my personal bloviation and bring some of these colleagues who have done so much to empower all this progress that uh, we've had in the Delta. So I'll bring a, a couple of uh, uh, farmers, board members, uh, reclamation district uh, uh, folks, and give you a little bit of flavor for the talent and the passion that uh, some of these constituents bring to make this progress happen. So I appreciate that. Thank you both. Any other questions or comments from? Joaquin, you're on mute. Maybe oh. some words. Hey, yeah, am I? You're okay no. now. Okay, sorry. Apologize if I was. Uh, you know, f finally um, had a moment, mute moment then. Um, thank you, Mr. George, and thank you uh, for the good questions, Vice Chair. Any other uh, questions from colleagues? Okay, thank you, really appreciate it. And we can just roll into then what is our next item and good to see you, Dr. Larson, our uh, quarterly uh, Delta Stewardship Council lead scientist report. And, uh, you know, had a, you know, 
good uh, overview from uh, Mr. George on, on matters and looking forward to really diving into what the Stewardship Council has been up to and uh, the, the latest, greatest on, on what is, I know, a, a very quickly moving and evolving uh, scientific landscape. So good to see you. Good to see you as well, Chair Esquivel and board members. Thank you for having me again. Uh, hopefully the quality of my audio will be okay. My internet just went out moments ago in the windstorm, and so I'm joining on my phone right now. Um, but I'm just going Thank to start you. out. Great. Uh, I'm just going to start out by saying that I respectfully disagree with the Delta Water Master Michael George, and say that for me it's far easier to precede him than to go after him. I could think of nobody who would be more effective in his role in the Delta community. And I take so much inspiration from his ability to make the complexity of work in the Delta accessible for so many people. And also in his skills, uh, and also I'm inspired by his skills in clear communication and collaboration. So it's an honor to go after you, but a little bit intimidating as well. <laughs> so I have a lot to report on today, uh, and I'm going to organize my report by some of the key roles that the science program plays in the Delta science community. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? And the first theme I'll report on is our work in prioritizing and funding science. Next slide. I've spoken with you all before in the last quarter about our work on the science action agenda. And just as a reminder, this is a document that is really produced by the Delta community for the Delta community. It was produced through over a year of engagement with Delta stakeholders to identify the most pressing management questions that are in need of more science to support them. And then to come together and identify science actions that will address those most press pressing management needs. So the Science Action Agenda is a, a document that's designed to really prioritize and align science actions with management over the four to five year time scale. Uh, and we are at the cusp of producing the final version of the 2022 to 2026 Science Action Agenda. Our public comment period closed on January 21st of 2022. Uh, and I just wanna extend a particular thanks to the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Board for submitting uh, valuable comments for us to consider, um, as well as other viewers of this meeting who might have also submitted comments. Uh, our revisions are currently underway, actively so, and we expect that the final science action agenda will be available by late spring of 2022. Next slide. So the science action agenda is a document that we use in the Delta Science program to establish priorities for funding work. Uh, some of that work uh, is funded through our biannual proposal solicitation. And last year I reported on uh, many of the exciting new projects that we chose to fund in the last cycle last year. Uh, we are gearing up right now to award funds to students who want to work on these Delta science issues through our Delta science fellowship program. Uh, we have an, RF, an RFA that is out to solicit proposals for Delta science fellows. Um, this is a program that is targeted for master's students, PhD students, and postdoctoral scholars. And it's designed to provide two years of research support as well as stipends for these students uh, for the 2022 to 2024 academic years. Uh, one of the really unique features of this fellowship program is that it provides um, many opportunities for mentorship. We require prospective fellows to identify both a research mentor and what we're calling a community mentor. And these community mentors are sometimes they're practitioners that use uh, science in order to make decisions or implement policy or implement actions. Um, sometimes they are scientists that are that do their work very much in line with agency missions. Um, but right now we are looking to solicit potential community mentors for the perspective 
fellows who will be applying through this program. So please get in touch with myself or Lauren Hastings at the Delta Science Program if you would like to be a community mentor uh, for this program. Going back to the research, all of the research that the fellows propose must be aligned with the 2022 to 2026 Science Action Agenda. So we've made the draft uh, document available to all of all of the um, potential fellows, and we'll be providing them with the updated text as soon as it's available. A few things are new uh, with this with our program this year, and I should say that this is the thirteenth year that we've run the Delta Science Fellowship Program, so it is a well established program. But a few things are new that we're really excited about, and one is that we are now having a separate track for funding social science research. Um, so what we're requiring prospective fellows to do is identify whether they prefer their work to be reviewed by a panel of social science experts or a panel of experts in the biological, physical, chemical sciences. Um, and we hope that this will help us make a dent in the, the dearth of understanding of social science processes uh, within the Delta. Uh, another item that's new this year is that all applicants are required to submit a non-binding, non-competitive uh, notice of intent uh, to sub submit a proposal. And the deadline for that is at the end of this month. Um, this is just something that's going to help us formulate the strongest review panels possible. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is there, there's a few other dates to be uh, aware of. One is right around the corner. On February 7th, we're running an informational webinar to help prospective fellows uh, craft the most competitive proposals possible. And then the application deadline itself is April 20th of 2022. So next slide, please. Uh, another thing I'd like to say about this Delta Science Fellowship opportunity is that we really envision this program as helping us to craft the next generation of science leaders in the Delta. If you look at past classes of Delta Science Fellows, they have gone on to do amazing things, uh, both in our community and in other communities, such as uh, the Puget Sound. Um, a lot of them go on to fill science leadership positions or run research labs um, that are producing science relevant to management and policy. Uh, we recently took a stab at following up with previous Delta Science Fellows uh, who were part of our 2018 class. And uh, we have all of their stories and products compiled in our Delta Breeze Science Funding Newsletter. Um, this is a, a quarterly publication that we just started putting out last year. And our fall issue of that, there, there's a link that you could see at the bottom, but you could also just get there from our webpage. Um, our fall issue of that newsletter profiles that class of amazing Delta Science Fellows. So I encourage you to take a look at that and also to stay tuned for future editions of the Delta Breeze. Next slide, please. Really appreciate uh, the work that's gone on to really create um, that, that community um, and elevating uh, the stories and work of all the many great researchers and uh, scientists that we have working in the Delta on these uh, critical issues. It's um, really appreciated the, the care and attention to, to really uh, creating a, a sense of community amongst you know, what is a, a really in incredible and important cohort out there. So just thank you for that. Well, thank you. And um, I'll also add, I have a flag for this later in my update, but um, the Delta Science Fellows are going to be spotlighted in the upcoming Interagency Ecological Program Workshop, which will take place on March 23rd and 24th. And so I will have a few more details on that in, in a few more slides. Um, but under this umbrella theme of funding and prioritizing research, as you all know, one of the areas of research that we're really prioritizing right now within the Delta Science Program is growing um, the, the breadth and depth of social science research that is pertinent to the Delta. Um, I've reported before on the formation of a, Delta, uh, a Bay Delta social science community of practice, which is being led by Dr. Jessica Rudnick, a Sea Grant Extension Specialist who's housed within the council. And I have a, a brief update on that community of practice. First of all, the, the steering committee 
met on January 18th. Um, and that committee and, and the community of practice includes social science researchers, agency scientists, and practitioners who are interested in building knowledge on the social, political, and cultural dynamics of the Delta. At that January meeting, the new webpage for the community was announced. This webpage was just launched, uh, and the hyperlink is uh, what you can see here on the slide. Uh, the bulk of that meeting consisted of a really interesting presentation by Randy Schuster of the USGS, who's working within the US Department of the Interior to build a social, behavioral, economic, science community of practice in order to connect social sciences across federal, agency, across federal agencies within DOI. Uh, many good ideas were exchanged with our community of practice uh, and the steering committee is right now in the process of setting their goals for 2022 and they discuss new synthesis or research efforts that the members might initiate in the upcoming year. Uh, so I will continue to report out on the work done by this community. Uh, next slide, one of the, the things related to social science research that I particularly wanted to report on, um, if I could see the next slide, is our environmental justice initiative. Uh, this is initiative, this is an initiative that the council is undertaking um, in alignment with the state of California's prioritization of environmental justice. Uh, we recognize that many of the council's peer state agencies have recently adopted or are in the process of developing environmental justice policies, principles, or guidelines. And the council's five-year review, which included surveys and stakeholder interviews, identified environmental justice as a key emerging issue, noting a specific need for more information and analysis in order to inform potential future actions. So as part of that five-year review, the council recommended that an issue paper be prepared to investigate the potential need for additional strategies or responses within the Delta plan to address disadvantaged communities and environmental justice. Uh, so just a few words on what is an issue paper and why we're taking this route. Um, an issue paper uh, is a paper that summarizes the best available science and stakeholder input. And we at the council felt that it was the best route to educate and, and inform the council on the topic and potential actions that could be taken. Uh, what do we hope to get out of this? Well, drawing upon that five-year review, our public participation plan, and the Delta ADAPTS outreach process, uh, staff have developed uh, a number of objectives for this project as a starting point for further discussion, both within the council and with other interested parties uh, like the water board. So uh, these objectives include building a network of community leaders and organizations to inform and support the council's environmental justice work, identifying environmental justice issues within the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, the Delta watershed and areas that use Delta water, and then three, identifying options to address those issues. Uh, once the issue paper is complete, implementation options are going to be presented for the Delta Stewardship Council to consider. And then our council members will direct staff regarding options that they hope to carry forward. Uh, next slide, please. Just to give you a little more information, uh, we started this process with an analysis of public comments uh, from meetings and written documents to get a preliminary sense of the issues relevant to community members within the Delta. Of the 368 comments that were reviewed, 278 of those were from comment letters, 90 were from oral comments, and then uh, out of those comments that were reviewed, 53 of them raised issues related to environmental justice. So that, that's a substantial fraction. Uh, the team is now in the process of planning and conducting interviews, uh, they determined that one of their key data collection activities for the white paper would be to conduct interviews with environmental justice organizations and community-based organizations in order to hear directly from environmental justice advocates and groups working on the front lines of these issues about what the problems are, how, how they're impacting different communities, and what solutions should be explored to address those issues. 
uh, the interview guide was then reviewed by environmental justice scholars, the environmental justice expert group that I talked about earlier, and then by the UC San Diego Institutional Review Board in order to ensure that best practices and ethical research with human sub subjects are to be followed. Uh, the council is currently reaching out to environmental justice organizations and community-based organizations in the Bay and Delta working on these issues in order to seek voluntary participants for the interviews. And I'd just like to make a pitch here in case anyone attending your meeting uh, wants to participate, you can get in touch with myself or Amanda Bull or Jessica Rudnick at the council um, and we can pass along that request. Uh, the group is also conducting a literature review uh, of at least 36 different papers. Um, they, in the last year, conducted a seminar series that consisted of four public seminars, um, including Laurel on, on your board. Um, we heard from various experts in water justice, government environmental justice work, indigenous and climate justice. Uh, we had approximately 75 to 100 attendees at each seminar which is a high level of attendance for us. So this is an issue that is really striking um, much interest. Um, and then we expect that we will release this issue paper for public draft in late summer of 2022. So I'd be happy to take questions on that initiative as part of the Q&A for this report, or do you feel free to cut in if there are any pressing ones right now? Um, and otherwise, I'll move to the next slide and a discussion of some of our ongoing efforts to promote collaboration and synthesis. And uh, next slide, please. I'm going to start out with a report out on a partnership that the Delta Science Program has engaged in with the National Center for Analysis and Synthesis. And I'm gonna start by saying a few words about the motiv motivation for this partnership, which I have mentioned briefly in October uh, before the group really got going. And then I'll talk about the methods that this group is, is using. Um, so first of, our, first of all, the origins of this partnership are in a call from the Collaborative Adaptive Management Team or CAMPT and other collaborative groups um, to develop predictive tools, models essentially, that will help us to anticipate the outcome of flow actions like the North Delta flow actions um, which can help us decide whether and when to implement those costly high effort endeavors. Um, and specifically these calls were focused on a need for developing a, a model of Delta food webs. Uh, these calls also echo a call from the Independent Science Board in their recent invasive species report, which specifies food web models as a critical need. Uh, in particular, that report demonstrates how models can help us make connections in advance between habitat restoration or flow actions and benefits for native fishes. Uh, but the challenge of developing a food web model is, is truly a big one. Uh, what's so challenging about it? Well, for one, for decades, through the Interagency Ecological Program and other entities, we've been collecting monitoring data on phytoplankton, environmental drivers, and fish species. And this collectively constitutes a big data set in the classical sense. But individual data collection efforts are typically focused on individual species or groups of species, but there is not necessarily coordination across these efforts to monitor different components of the food web. Similarly, funding for data collection often doesn't extend to funding for analysis. So it could be very challenging, costly, and time consuming to use existing data to address holistic questions about the system because data sets often aren't compatible. They might have different formats, different timestamps, and different assumptions that were invoked in data, in data processing. Um, and up until very recently, many of those data sets might not have been accessible, though AB 1755, as you well know, is changing that for the better. Um, another challenge is that techniques for analyzing big data sets like these are evolving rapidly and scientists who are subject matter experts often don't have the skills to do this analysis in a way that answers big questions. Uh, these challenges often thwart seeing the return on scientific investment because without these big picture analyses, 
we can't answer some of the biggest questions relevant to management needs, such as the impacts of planned restoration or flow actions. Uh, synthesis is an approach to scientific discovery that allows us to look across these individual data collection efforts and answer big picture questions about the whole system. It's an increasingly critical science need and is actually one of the core functions of the Delta Science Program. Um, but synthesis needs are far bigger than any one agency can tackle. So the, the Delta Science Program engaged in its partnership with the National Center for Analysis and Synthesis as a way to provide training to our broader community of scientists so as to enable far more agencies and scientists to perform this type of uh, scientific endeavor. So through the NC's Delta Science Program partnership, a working group of 19 participants from nine agencies and universities convened for three weeks of both training on uh, data science and reproducible science approaches and collaborative work that was focused on identifying these drivers of the Delta, the Bay Delta Estuarine food web. Uh, the working group took place in person at UC Davis over three weeks in September, October, and November. Uh, some of their research questions included, what are the key drivers of food webs from plants to plankton to fish? Uh, how have invasive species shaped uh, Delta communities? And then how can restoration and flow management protect and enhance the food supply for fishes of management interest under future climate change and management scenarios? Uh, next slide, please. Prior to these in-person meetings and through the summer, Delta Science Program staff and NCs pulled together the data that would be needed to analyze the relationships between these different components of the food web and environmental factors. And through that effort, they produced a ready-to-go database that will be made accessible to others as one of the products of this working group. Uh, the participants worked with and continue to work with this data set in two working subgroups which are focused on under, understanding the effect of flood management on estuary health. And then the other one is uh, identifying drivers of food web dynamics on an estuary scale. We anticipate that products from this working group will offer strong scientific support to inform decision-making for restoration, protection of endangered species and management of flow actions. Uh, and the focus on food webs here really does serve broad interagency goals such as ecosystem function, resilience and sustainability. Uh, these subgroups will also be presenting at the upcoming Interagency Ecological Program workshop in March that I mentioned recently in a session chaired by Sam Beshevkin and, and Rosie Hartman. Um, and with that, I think I will go to the next slide. This is just a slide that I showed you in October, but it's a great reminder of the type of workflow and, um, and a good visualization of the type of products that this group hopes to produce. So essentially what they're doing here is they're combining data from monitoring programs on species abundance and where it's distributed. Um, and then looking at uh, developing statistical models for species abundance as a function of temperature and salinity and time and space. And with that, with those models, with those statistical models, they'll be able to take outputs of um, planning models that look at future climate or uh, future environmental conditions given certain management actions in order to generate maps that predict species abundance and distribution. So we're really looking forward to those products. With that, I'll go to the next slide. Um, and report out on another recent meeting that was held in December. Uh, the, and the meeting was the meeting of the Delta Interagency Invasive Species Coordination Team. It, uh, it was their symposium, which is a biennial event. Um, in 2013, the Delta Interagency Invasive Species Coordination Team, or DISC, was formed to foster communication and collaboration among California state agencies that detect prevent and manage invasive species and restore invaded habitats within the Delta. Uh, participants in DISC include state agency program managers and scientists, research and conservation groups, federal agencies and other stakeholders, and the Delta Stewardship Council is a co-chair of that group. 
Uh, as outlined in the Invasive Species Coordination Framework, the goals of the DISC team are to establish a framework for strategic planning, coordinated implementation, education and outreach, data management, research needs and funding. And one of the ways that they do this is by holding a biennial symposium. The December symposium focused on the challenge of early detection and rapid response to species invasions or EDRR. EDRR is to be seen as a second line of defense for our system once prevention measures have failed. Eradication at these early stages before the species has had a chance to get established and spread is both the most cost-effective and efficient way to protect our system from the ongoing threat of, of invasive species. Uh, the sessions in this symposium focused on lessons learned from EDRR efforts in other systems, successes and setbacks in EDRR efforts in the Delta, and emerging EDRR tools and challenges. The symposium laid a foundation for developing a framework for implementing EDRR in a systematic way within the Delta, and I'm happy to report that uh, the planning for that framework and the launch of that framework is now underway. Next slide. Looking ahead, I'm excited to report on a three-part brown bag webinar series on Delta governance that the science program is queuing up for the spring. Uh, this is a series that will foster discussion of the complex and multifaceted governance of the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. The panelists have been selected to represent a wide range of perspectives from federal, state, local, and tribal government. Um, and it, it will explore collaborative partnerships between government and non-government entities and also feature academic social scientists. Uh, each webinar will focus on a different social scientific framework that can be used to understand Delta governance. The first webinar takes place on March 1st and it will focus on environmental governance, highlighting the structures and processes within which decision-making and action for environmental management occurs. Confirmed speakers include Mark LaBelle of UC Davis, uh, Sacramento County District 5 Supervisor Don Natoli, who's also a Delta Stewardship Council member, and Kaylee Allen, uh, Assistant Director with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The second webinar on April 13th focuses on collaborative governance, highlighting how partnerships and decentralized structures and processes are used by government and non-government entities to influence decision making. This webinar will feature presentations by Matthew Moore, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer of the United Auburn Indian Community, Jessica Law, Executive Director of the Water Forum, Andrea Gerlach of the University of Arizona, and Brett Milligan of UC Davis. And then the third and final webinar on, on May 5th will focus on adaptive governance, highlighting how governance arrangements can be responsive to changing social and environmental condi conditions and also support adaptive management. Panelists at that webinar include Tanya Heckela of UC Denver, of, of UC, Den, UC Colorado, uh, University of Colorado, Denver, <laughs> too many UCs in my mind. And uh, she's also a member of our independent science board. Uh, other panelists include Harriet Lai Ross, as, assistant director for planning at the Delta Stewardship Council, Hannah Gosnell of Oregon State University and Nusha Ajami, who was recently appointed Chief Development Officer for Research at Berkeley Labs Earth and Environmental Science Area. Uh, we're hoping that these talks are going to increase awareness of and engagement with the social, political and institutional dimensions of Delta science and management and help us think about what kinds of institutional structures and processes support effective and equitable Delta management. Should be a great event. Uh, I encourage you to attend. Attendance is free, but um, there is advanced registration that's required. Uh, next slide. So my, my last slide in this segment of my report is uh, just a list of some other upcoming workshops. And just around the corner, actually starting tomorrow, is our Adapting Restoration for a Changing Climate Symposium, which is a virtual two-day meeting. The meeting, uh, which is organized by the Delta Science Program, explores how restoration projects in the Bay Delta are integrating both immediate and long-term climate change considerations into their planning and implementation. Uh, the meeting will consist of talks, panels, and interactive discussions, uh, and, and those events are going to explore the planning, implementation, funding, permitting, collaboration, and communication strategies for climate adaptive restoration, 
and will emphasize the importance of long-term resilience in the face of sea level rise. This conference is also virtual and free, but requires advanced registration. I also mentioned that the IEP workshop or integrated um, interagency ecological program workshop is coming up on March 22nd and 23rd. Um, the, it will feature the Delta Science Fellows and early career scientists as a major focus. Uh, and that workshop will also include training on statistical analysis in R. Um, it will have lightning talks and a poetry slam, which is always a big hit. And uh, it will have sessions that are focused on the experimental release of Delta smelt, longfin smelt, Delta salmon, and other resident fishes. Uh, if you navigate to the IEP webpage, you could find a registration link. And then finally, I'd like to highlight a salinity management workshop series. Uh, we're still finalizing the dates of those workshops within the planning committee, but um, this is something that I, I think would be of particular interest to the water board. Uh, just earlier today in talking about the Delta dry year response pilot program, Michael George argued that there's a broad consensus that we have to plan ahead for drought but also acknowledge that this is a really difficult thing to do. Uh, this type of advanced planning is something that we are trying to orchestrate with a number of agencies uh, through the salinity management workshop series, which Michael George himself is, is helping to plan on the planning committee. Uh, council staff led by Karen K. Fitz is coordinating with the committee that consists of individuals from at least 10 different institutions and includes several social scientists um, rather than being focused on the current drought or reinventing previous and ongoing drought synthesis meetings and work groups, this workshop is really designed to promote that sort of forward thinking, anticipatory, collaborative planning for distinct future scenarios. We're hoping that at the outcome of this series of workshops in 2022, we launch a much larger scale and potentially more inclusive process of um, participatory planning for salinity management in the face of future drought that can that considers a range of management alternatives um, ranging beyond the use of salinity barriers and delta cross channel operation um, but also looking at um, at uh, natural solutions for mitigating salinity such as particular wetland restoration designs uh, we're also hoping that this model-based scenario planning exercise will consider a much wider range of outcomes, um, including economic outcomes and impacts on in-Delta communities uh, than have been considered in the past. Uh, so we're, uh, we're also going to be exploring the ability of agencies to meet their regulatory constraints under these different scenario plans. So please stay tuned to this salinity management workshop series. Uh, we will be making announcements through the council listserv uh, that are uh, relevant to the, the dates of the workshop and how to get involved. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, I'd like to say a few words about science communication and outreach within the council. Uh, next slide. And one is just a reminder that the Delta Lead Scientists Ask Me Anything series continues on a monthly basis. Um, this is truly a forum to ask any questions you might have, but to structure the conversation, we do uh, establish particular themes for each event. And this uh, slide just gives you a snapshot of what some of those themes over the past um, over the past four months have been. The most recent took place yesterday uh, and was focused on science synthesis activities, including that NC's working group that I uh, just reported to you about with Sam Bashevkin and Pascal Gertler. Other recent topics include the Science Action Agenda, the Delta Science Fellowship Program, and um, our state fellowship program, uh, both of which are done in partnership with California Sea Grant. So archives of all past sessions are available on Instagram from the council's webpage. And our next session is coming up on, the, on February 28th at noon. Um, and we'll likely, this is still tentative, but we'll likely be focused on the Delta Science Tracker. Next slide. One other outreach item 
that is uh, that, that might be worthy of your attention is that on December 3rd, the Delta Science Program partnered with California Council on Science and Technology to provide a legislative briefing on cascading and compounding impacts of drought in the Delta. Uh, we had a panel consisting of four members. Uh, it was a really great conversation. Um, we had a number of pre-planned questions, but then members of the Legislative Assembly were also able to ask us specific questions. I, I moderated the panel um, and this is now available online to watch from the California Council on Science and Technology's webpage. Next slide. Dr. Dr. Larson, um, yes. any highlights um, from you know, either the questions or uh, any of the exchange? Um, just kind of wondering. Yeah, yeah, th that's a great question. Um, so I think some of the highlights were the discussion of what to anticipate with future climate, uh, by, which was addressed by Daniel Swain, one of the panelists. There was also a lot of really good discussion around impacts of drought on invasive species in the Delta, uh, impacts of drought on uh, agricultural practices in the Delta and soil salinization. Um, so those were some of the topics that uh, the panel really spent a lot of time discussing. Great, thank you, appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah, next slide. So going along with the theme of highlighting our Delta Science Fellows, I recently reported out to the council on some of the work um, thematically clustered by our 2018 class of Delta Science Fellows. And our state fellow, Karen Gutierrez, prepared this really neat uh, slide that highlights the work of three of these fellows that I thought I'd briefly share with you. Um, so those, th these three fellows were all in separate projects looking at the impacts of various stressors on native fish communities within the Delta. Um, Yuzo Yanagitsuru from UC Davis was looking at, um, at longfin smelt and in particular the UC Davis captive breeding program for longfin smelt, which was launched fairly recently after longfin smelt went through a bottleneck in their population in 2018. That captive breeding program has not had much success using the same protocol for raising these fish as, as, as they use for Delta smelt. And so he was really trying to get at why that program has not been successful. And he tested the hypothesis that longfin smelt actually require lower temperatures uh, for hatching and early growth than Delta smelt do. And he found that indeed, uh, smelt embryos re re reared at lower temperatures than this lab uses for rearing delta smelt had a higher hatch success rate and larger size overall. And this growth rate is really important for the survival of young fish because um, when they're larger, they can swim faster and they have a higher probability of successfully feeding, um, which is really Im important once the yolk and oil of their eggs have been reabsorbed. Um, and so this is something that could have a, a market impact on their survival. However, these results weren't perfect in the sense that um, they still found that there was mass mortality of the, of the smelt embryos um, before all of the yolk and oil had been reabsorbed. So there might be something else going on that influences their success. Uh, but this work is really essential to uh, building a, a feasible program for rearing long fin smelt, which could become an essential uh, component of their recovery. The second, uh, in, in the second column, we profiled Levi Lewis, who now runs uh, a research lab at UC Davis, but was a former Delta Science Fellow. Uh, in, in his fellowship, Levi really, you know, did a, a underwent a tremendous effort to bring a new method to understanding uh, Delta smelt. So this is a method that uses otoliths, which are tiny bones within the inner ears of fish. These bones accumulate growth rings, kind of like the growth rings of trees that can be very precisely dated and measured 
in order to measure growth rate over a period of time as small as as small or as precise as two weeks. So this is really important because in studies of wild delta smelt, it's really challenging to correlate things such as their size to environmental conditions that they're experiencing chiefly because they move around so much. And so there's no guarantee that the environmental conditions that you're measuring at a particular place where you've captured delta smelt actually have influenced any of the properties of the smelt that you are measuring during that capture process. So in, in this uh, work that was reported on in Marine Ecology Progress Series, Levi Lewis and uh, co-authors uh, used archived specimens of delta smelt um, in, in order to measure their growth rate for the two weeks of time prior to capture. Uh, over that small period of time, it's a pretty safe assumption that the environmental conditions that were simultaneously measured at the time of capture did indeed influence that growth rate over that, that small period of time. And so he was able to explore the effects of both water temperature and water clarity on delta smelt. And he found that the growth rates declined rapidly at temperatures greater than 20 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and as water clarity increases. Um, and you know, increasing water clarity is a somewhat recent issue in the Delta as sediment inputs from the hydraulic mining era diminish and um, as a result of the invasion of clams like the overbite clam. And so this work decisively confirmed some of the assumptions that scientists and managers had been operating under. Um, but he was also able to look at influences of salinity and, and found that the X2 based salinity standard used for management of delta smelt doesn't have any particular correlation to uh, properties of, the, of delta smelt that they were measuring. So. That, that's something with a distinct management relevance. Uh, in the final column, we profiled work by Annalise Del Rio, who looked at the effects of water temperature and oxygen on Chinook salmon embryos in the lab. Um, and she was able to look at, she, she was specifically interested in addressing sublethal uh, impacts of these different environmental stressors on the Chinook salmon. A lot of times our management is based on um, thresholds in water temperature or other variables that cause mortality uh, for the species, but populations might also decline as a result of sublethal impacts related to the metabolism of the fish and their swimming speed and ability to evade predators and feed successfully. And so in this experiment, she looked at the metabolic rate of Chinook salmon embryos um, as a marker of um, their overall health or their overall condition. She found that embryos reared in warm water experienced the greatest impact on metabolic rate. And there is an error in this figure, the X should be on the upper right rather than the lower right. But um, she found that embryos re re reared in both warm water and low oxygen also had decreased hatch rates. And so that was really a, a double whammy here. Um, next slide, I know I'm getting short on time, but I just wanted to call your attention to two articles that are uh, either literally in press or hot off the press that are lead authored by Delta Science Program staff. And the first is an in press paper by Sam uh, Beshevkin and Brian Mahardia uh, on seasonally variable relationships between surface water temperature and inflow in the upper San Francisco estuary. Uh, this paper is a result of another synthesis uh, that was done using uh, five decades worth of delta temperature data, uh, as well as data on delta inflows and outflows from the day flow model. Um, and they, uh, they basically were able to look at correlations or an association between inflow rates and temperature in different parts of the delta, so over both space and time. And what they found is that negative temperature inflow relationships are seen um, during late spring and summer months 
um, meaning higher inflow is associated with cooler water temperatures. Uh, and these correlations tend to be strongest in the Sacramento River Basin that compared to the San Joaquin River Basin. Uh, on the other hand, during the winter, they tend to see positive relationships between water temperature and inflow, meaning that higher inflow is correlated with warmer water. Uh, Sam is very careful to point out that this study is looking at correlations, not causation. So you can't necessarily say that, um, that dam releases trigger cooler temperatures during the summertime because there could be other factors at play here. But this is a first step toward trying to understand the results or, or the, the impact that inflow to the Delta has on temperatures. And this group recommends that further studies do try to get at causal impacts of releases of water from dams um, using other statistical techniques. Uh, I'll also point out that this work is consistent with other published work by Matt Nabriga et al. in 2021, which also found negative relationships between flow and water temperature uh, within the Delta in April, May, and June. So this might be a period of time in which, you know, if, if this correlation ends up being a causation, this might be a period of time in which we might be able to manipulate water temperatures within the Delta just enough to get it to get that temperature below certain critical thresholds for fish. We're not at the point where we could say that conclusively yet. And in fact, Sam recommends that this article mainly be used to look at future projections of inflow to the Delta and use those projections to predict what the distribution of temperature will be. Um, and in turn, use those projections as information for management of fish species for which temperature is a really critical variable. But this is certainly an interesting paper. Um, and it is available on Eco Archive right now, but it will be on the Limnology and Oceanography website very shortly. The second paper, uh, and if I could go to the next slide, that would be great. The second and last paper that I'll profile today is one that was lead authored by Annika Keeley. Uh, this literally just came out a few days ago. Um, this paper is a product of a connectivity symposium that the Delta Science Program held at UC Davis on February 18th of 2020, just before the pandemic shut everything down. Um, so this is a, another synthesis paper. This is an informational synthesis paper that explores the concept of connectivity and its many dimensions um, in estuaries and discusses why this concept is important for uh, governing across boundaries, for understanding cross-scale linkages within estuaries, um, and managing these really complex estuarine systems. So in this paper, ecological connectivity here is described as the flow of organisms and materials across space and time. Um, it's merged with concepts of hydrological connectivity and socio-ecological connectivity in order to support a cross-scale understanding of, um, of uh, multiple aspects of the system and laying a foundation for successful governance of complex boundary systems. Um, the, they use a new term called ecoscape connectivity, which is this merger of connectivity concepts across systems and scales. And they talk about five types of connectivity, uh, longitudinal connectivity, and one example of that would be uh, the disruption of connectivity that dams impose on sediment transport. So longitudinal connectivity, lateral connectivity, which is connectivity between waterways and um, associated floodplains. So one example of that might be how uh, sediment transported from waterways onto tidal marshes facilitates wetland elevation gain and um, enhances resilience to sea level rise. There's also vertical connectivity. Um, a lot of times hydrologists think of vertical connectivity as being surface, uh, subsurface exchange. Uh, going back to that sediment example, water depth is a strong control on sediment accretion. Um, and then there's also lattice connectivity and teleconnectivity where teleconnectivity is really 
uh, connectivity across different types of variables. So for example, um, uh, certain patterns in temperature might influence spatial distributions of fish. Um, the paper comes up with several governance recommendations based on this holistic analysis of connectivity. And this includes promoting conversations about ecoscape connectivity and governance, identifying and leveraging existing coordination capacity, identifying gaps in coordination, funding, and training, and then learning from other complex uh, hydrological systems. Um, and the article is general, it's focused on estuarine systems, but uses the Bay Delta as a case study. Um, and it specifically profiles the Frank's Tracks, the Frank's Track Futures project within the Delta. So I would encourage you to go take a look at that article, especially if you were in attendance at that connectivity sy symposium. And with that, I will open the floor to questions. Just incredibly appreciative, Dr. Larson, of the good overview of what is, uh, you know, uh, a really active landscape right now, and appreciative that it is because there's a lot of complex decision making we're all having to do uh, in the face of, uh, again, uh, just a, a developing and growing need to understand how these systems actually um, best interact, work, and how we can best make decisions that balance uh, what are, you know, so many critical needs throughout the Delta watershed, particularly, but you know similarly throughout watersheds in the state. You know, the, um, the question I have is, is really around um, the food web um, uh, modeling that's gonna be done. Um, as you know, we have, you know, critical projects like the water quality control plan update. Um, there's discussions around uh, voluntary agreements and all of them share actions that we're all contemplating and trying to best understand the benefits of and the impacts to um, things, the, the, the estuary, and here I think of, you know, variables like outflow, but that um, mm -hmm. aren't just a single number, are part of a complex system that include salinity and temperature, but importantly are trying to drive really these system-wide changes in food web production and um, ecosystem resilience, if you will, in a way. So just kind of wondering um, how um, I saw the timeline uh, looking, at, you know, uh, having something by mid-summer Mm -hmm. And or fall, it's sounding like that will be out and replicable insofar as the, the modeling work, the R code and all that. Um, and I yeah. guess what's your, what is your sense of, of its applicability to some of the discussions that we're having out there? Are, is this uh, yeah. a real potential tool that we can actually uh, uh, start applying or, or using somehow in our discussions? Um, because, you know, that year time frame here is going to be important to us as we have further discussion on the water quality control plan update and you know, um, really want to understand how best we we take advantage of what's a lot of a, a growing field um, in really having a systems approach and thought to uh, the actions that um, the board is contemplating. Yes, I, I would say the answer to your question is yes. This, this group is really hoping to produce understanding that could inform um, all of those efforts that you talked about. And so they are going to, in addition to their scientific papers that they hope will get into the review pipeline by the end of the year, they are going to be producing a series of fact sheets and briefing documents. And I could be sure to share that with you and your team. Um, this team would also be happy, I'm, I'm sure, to make presentations to uh, select groups as they advance their thinking about topics uh, that would benefit from having this information. So let, let's stay in touch about that. Great. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, fellow board colleagues, any comments uh, or questions? Yeah, I, I have a question and uh, thank you so much. This was a really fantastic presentation and I have notes and lots of different um, events that you summarized that I'm interested in uh, uh, checking out if I get the chance. So thank you for you know always coming and sharing your thoughts. You're obviously very busy. Uh, and so I just wanted to go back to your kind of a, on a related note, your slide uh, talking about the Delta Invasive Species Symposium. Um, mm -hmm. And if, you don't have to pull it up, but you know, just a I'm question. I'm just pulling it up that. on my computer for my reference. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's just a picture. Um, so, you know, one of these things that I've struggled with understanding, you know, I, I know that you mentioned the overbite clam and we've, we've been, had lots of challenges, especially in dry years with an invasive species proliferation. 
But one thing I've really um, been trying to kind of wrap my mind around is the, the magnitude of the impact on our species in the Delta. And so, you know, from the symposium or from other work, are, are we getting a sense for how extensive, you know, it, you know that inv invasive species are as a stressor? on whether it's delta smell or looking at other species, you know, are, are we getting any takeaways and things that we can use going forward here? Yeah, uh, it, it's a great question. And um, I, there's several things I wanna say in response to that. So there have been a few um, synthesis documents recent, recently that have attempted to summarize the state of the science um, relevant to invasive species in the Delta. And one is the review that the Independent Science Board just completed in 2020 um, on invasive species, which is publicly available on the ISB's website. Um, the second is that we are in the process of producing the next edition of State of Bay Delta Science, uh, which is a document that we put out on a regular basis that's intended to summarize the state of understanding on particular issues. The one that we're preparing for release in late 2022 is focused on ecosystem services and disservices associated with plants and algae, uh, primary producers in the Delta. Uh, and there is a chapter, there are two chapters actually that are focused on invasive species. Um, one of which really quantifies the magnitude of influence in an economic way. So it looks at um, the history of control of invasive species and lessons learned and includes statistics on the amount that we spend annually in the Delta to control invasive species. Um, so that's looking back, looking forward. One of the topics that came up again and again in our science actions workshop was this need to understand linkages between invasive species and other components of the Delta system. Um, so one of the things that we're learning is that actually many times our wetland restoration projects open up new opportunities for species invasions and that those species invasions can then hinder the establishment and success of those projects because invasive species in the margins tend to trap a lot of the sediment that would otherwise be transported up onto the marshes and is really essential for their persistence in the face of sea level rise. So one of the things we've learned through that, and, th and this is primarily citing work by uh, Judy Drexler at the USGS. One of the things that we've learned from that is that it's really critical to target our management of invasive species to particular locations. So for instance, um, in the vicinity of planned wetland restoration, it's really critical. Um, you know, invasive species aren't going away in the Delta. It's a massive problem and it is technically infeasible to eradicate all of the invasive species. And so figuring out how to really effectively prioritize control of invasive species and look at the costs and benefits of doing so, which hasn't been done to a great degree yet, is a, a critical science need. Um, so a lot of active discussions on this topic recently. Uh, the other thing that is relevant here is that it's looking likely that invasive species, so floating and submerged aquatic vegetation might have a link um, to harmful algal blooms. You know, when we install, when, the, when DWR installed the salinity barrier across the False River this past year, um, conditions in Frank's tract were a little different from when the salinity barrier was established in 2015. Um, and this is one of the things that we actually talked about in the um, cascading and compounding Im impacts of drought briefing uh, chaired by CCST. Um, so in 2015, when that barrier was installed, the main impact that we saw on Frank's tract was a spread of floating and submersed invasive species. Uh, there was no harmful algal bloom that year. But this past year, there was a harmful algal bloom. And there's been a lot of speculation, no, no conclusive results yet, but a lot of speculation that the presence of invasive, invasive uh, floating and submersed species, which hasn't diminished since 2015, uh, might have been decreasing residence time in that area. There could be effects on stratification that would 
lead to a higher risk of development of a harmful algal bloom. And so these linkages are you know, research that is actively being prioritized both by the Delta Science Program and by the larger community. Um, you know, I think the salinity barrier and the reduced residence time that results from that might also be an opportunity to explore novel techniques for control of invasive species. Uh, one of the things that we've learned in the Delta is that because it is a flowing system, techniques for control of invasive species that work well in lakes don't work so well. Um, and we really need to be innovative in thinking about how to do targeted control. And we could, we could think of these salinity management actions that have an impact on residence time as being an opportunity to evaluate some of these innovative new targeted techniques. Great, yeah, no, thank you. I, I appreciate all the work that you're doing and so many researchers and scientists are doing here. And, and you're, you're in particular, your open mind here about creative solutions and knowing that it's, you know, it's not one action that's going to solve any of these problems that we're facing, yeah. but we have to think, you know, outside the box, you know, in terms of what can we do to manage these, the situation and the Delta that we're faced with today and just yeah. um, being realistic about that. Um, thank you for all your work there. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Any other uh, questions or comments from colleagues? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Doctor. You know, I, I, it has been uh, certainly an incredible year um, with drought, uh, but also this whiplash and precipitation that we're seeing. A lot of, um, you know, active uh, need for just a better understanding of these systems that we're trying to manage uh, in difficult decision making space. But I, I'm just incredibly. Um, hardened by what is uh, a lot of really great, uh, incredible, and bright minds that are that are helping us all here better understand this complex challenge that we have in the Delta and this incredible watershed that spans, as we know, you know, nearly forty percent of the state. Um, it really, you know, uh, connects the activities of so many communities in ways that we're needing to just better understand. Um, and so, just really thank thank you for as as board member. McGuire said, your, your incredible openness um, and leadership here and what is um, a really dynamic time. So thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, that wraps up then uh, item number five and brings us then to our last item of this meeting with, which is just board member reports. Uh, do any board members here have any reports they'd like to provide? I'm quickly gonna scan my calendar. I don't think I had any real um, public engagements, just a lot of briefings and discussions here. Um, yeah, nothing nothing that um, I have to report. Looking uh, to others though. Um, I, have, I have just something that I'd like to flag for um, my fellow board members. I'm looking here for, um, some notes on my calendar though, and not coming across them readily. But um, we have a, an upcoming, or staff has an upcoming um, workshop on um, uh, water loss. And um, I sent a message to staff inquiring, I think I must've missed it in our briefing, um, that it was a staff workshop as opposed to a board member workshop. And so I'm just flagging that this is something that I'm uh, trying to pursue to see if uh, there's a way we can turn it into a board member workshop. And just generally speaking, um, maybe this is something that we could talk about in our next priorities discussion about um, when to have something be a staff workshop versus a board member workshop. Um, and, and also to see if we can, um, you know, just make sure that that gets flagged for us um, as we're, you know, maybe maybe you all were aware of this, but somehow I missed that and apologize for bringing it up so late. And I see um, Mr. Oppenheimer joining. Yeah, just in, in response to that, um, board member Diodamo, we are planning to have a board, like a regular board workshop, board member workshop. And I think we were planning to do that originally 
in the February, March time period. And just based on where we're at, I think we decided to push that to April. I don't think the date has um, been locked down yet, um, but just, I did want to let you know that the plan is to have a, um, a board member workshop like you're requesting. It would be after the initial comment period closes. So we'd have the benefit of getting all the comments from the public before doing that, but it would be during when we think the second comment period would be on the, um, on the rulemaking. Oh, so great. Hopefully, okay. that, hopefully that's responsive and we'll, we'll meet the needs. But um, you did mention previously that you thought it would be helpful to have a workshop where the board was present. And so we, we definitely want to accommodate that. And that that's our plan. It's just the timing's been a little bit um, delayed and different than we originally thought. So okay. apologize for any confusion that that's caused. No, probably confusion on my end as well. So thank you for that. That's added process and that's great. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Vice Chair. I appreciate the flag. Uh, fellow other colleagues here, any reports? Okay. Then this hearing none. Okay, thank you. All right, hearing none then, that actually then concludes uh, item number six as well and brings us to the end of our board meeting uh, agenda. Uh, relatively light day. Um, appreciate everyone's good uh, work, attention and thoughts today. Our next board meeting uh, will be February 15th and 16th. And then otherwise, we're adjourned until that time. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time. Be well, be safe. And we'll see you here uh, very soon. Thanks a lot. See everyone. <laughs>